Hello and welcome to the eighth episode of Orthodoxy, Autocracy, Nationality, Moscovy and the Golden Horde, or alternatively Moscovy and the Mongol Yoke. Very lucky, as always, to be joined by Columba and Marcus Pertinax. Hello, sirs. Good to be here. Good evening, everyone. Indeed, good to be here. Wonderful. And if any, I'm assuming that most of you have watched the previous episode, which ended the Battle of Kalka River. So we'll be taking off immediately after that, after the decimation of the um, the Rus nobles in 1223. Um, Genghis Khan, of course, dies in um, 1227. And the succession of the Mongol Empire is maintained through something called a Kurultai, whereby all of the princes of the Mongol Empire come together in the new city of Karakorum, a, a designated capital for the Mongol Empire, to elect a new great Khan. And Ogadai Khan, the third son of Genghis Khan, had already been pre-selected by Genghis, simply because the older brothers, Yoki, Yoki who was of a dubious um, parentage, uh, owing to you know, some... Um, issues with his mother, which you know, aren't really relevant to the stream. And of course, um, Chagatai Khan uh, despised each other. So the assumption was that if either Jockey or Chagatai became the rulers, the supreme Khan of the Mongol Empire, the empire would immediately devolve into civil war. So Ogadai was the, was the perfect choice, in addition to the fact that he was a proven and charismatic general. So he is elected as great Khan in 1229 to succeed his father Genghis, and continues the policy of his father of world conquests. And just to, again, give in perspective how vast the conquests of the Mongol Empire were, from 1227 until 1235, in a space of eight years, the Mongols are directing decisive campaigns. They're conquering the Northern Empire in China of the Jin. They're taking over Korea. They're consolidating their control over Iran um, after the remnants of the Khwarezmian Empire. They're finishing up their conquest in Georgia. And in 1235, they begin the full conquest of the Rus and, in fact, of most of Europe, which, again, we have to remember that the operation at Kalka, organized by Subutai and Jebe, had only been a reconnaissance mission. Now the Mongols are returning to lead a conquest of the region. Um, Marcus, if I'm correct, you have a quote referring to the planning of this operation. Uh, sure, I can sort of start off by sort of summarizing the the scale of um, of the of the force itself. So. Um, in because uh, you you mentioned uh, we we obviously ended last stream on the Kalka River and how this dispute between them was a reconnaissance in force sent by uh, Genghis um, and they had attacked these uh, steppe people the the Kipchaks and the Pechenegs etc and it was actually the the killing of um of uh, Mongol envoys by uh, Mr Slav the third that um earned the ire of the of the Mongols and uh, that obviously occurred in two two uh, twelve two three and so. If we fast forward to 12, uh, 1235, when um, Ogaday has become the Great Khan, and uh, after his campaigns in pacifying the the Jin, as you say, and finishing off the conquest of the Iranian Khwarezmian Empire, um, they they basically uh, Ogaday assembles his advisory council. Uh, his um, uh, there's a, there's a word for it in a, in, in the Mongol uh, lexicon. I think they call it a. a Quirultai, I think they, these are the word they use, and um, they're essentially determining the the direction of the of the next uh, scope of expansion, as you were mentioning, and uh, and they choose to to sort of venture back into the Kiev and Rus territories, and so this army is um is led. So it's by, like um, a sort of battle planning tradition yeah. or something. Yeah, it's, mm. it's it's the it's the OKW of the um of the Mongol horde, <laughs> essentially. You know, that's interesting. Um, and so uh, the, this new force is led by um, Subutai, who actually had partaken in the previous campaign with Jebe, uh, except this time it's led by Subutai and Batu, who's a grandson of, of, um, of Genghis Khan, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, and when they were um, assembling this force, uh, Changatai, um, one of the uh, members of the family, basically echoes his sentiment that um, they're at the end of the world, they are hard people. They are people who, when they become angry, would rather die by their own sword. So even though they'd assemble this mighty host of a of hundred thousand of, of men, and these are and, and these are, as the Mongols did do, they sort of function a bit like um, uh, when we talked about Rome, we sort of referred to them as the Borg in a previous stream. But the Mongols are kind of the same in this regard that when they come across superior um, uh, methodologies of war, superior technology, they very enthusiastically incorporate it into their army. And yeah, this I mean, is a force famously, that's comprised... 
famously, didn't they? I mean, they took loads of Chinese siege weaponry and stuff mm. into the war with exactly. the Rus. Yeah, they essentially have like a, a, a body core of Chinese siege engineers specifically for the purpose of tackling fortifications and and reducing um, defenses of cities. And so, 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 was, so would those? Um, I know it's a bit of a tangent, but just out of curiosity, would those devices sure. have been assembled by these Chinese engineers, sort of yes. relatively close to to the roof? So, because I can't imagine they took them over such long distances. Well, no, because it would have completely negated a their speed and yeah, their impossibility. Yeah, um, especially the, the the speed in which Mongols could travel um, as a whole complete army, never mind, um, because they really didn't carry much in the way of a baggage train. Um, yeah, it's a key as, part as, of the strategy, right? Exactly. And, and as we know, the Mongols, you know, sort of like their steppe predecessors were for, primarily fought on a, on, a, on horseback and, and, uh, and would travel great distances and would survive quite harsh conditions, um, almost as a matter of course, because these are men who are, or people, because they were women as well, but they were raised in these harsh sort of tundra steppe uh, conditions and were conditioned to living rough. And so they could travel uh, quite astonishing distances, surviving on very little and moving with great speed. And so this um, this force of 100,000 is made up of, um, of Uyghurs, of, of Tanguts, uh, Kitans, uh, Jurchens, and of course, um, you know, like you say, this this core of Chinese engineers. And... Um, and by 1237, they reach um, Ryazan, which is the first city they raise. Um, and and as uh, as Apostolic uh, alluded to, um, his neighbours uh, uh, to the north and to the south, these fellow Kievan princes, don't lift a finger. Um, the city is absolutely destroyed, and uh, the city doesn't last five days. It, it's it's besieged and captured and burnt to a crisp within five days. Um, and there's a source here from the Chronicle of Novgorod, um, if you'd like me to read it, Apostolic. Sure. The, the quote go, uh, says, They likewise killed men, women and children, monks, nuns and priests, some by fire, some by the sword. They violated nuns and priests' wives, good women and girls in the presence of their mothers and sisters. So that's quite uh, vivid, quite a vivid account mm. of, the, of, of how they... Um, very thoroughly put rise onto the sword. Um, I wonder. I mean, the sort of Mongol brutality that's so famed was it was it was it unique to them? Or when you look at you know other um, you know later on maybe the Crimean Tatars and stuff? Do you see or Tartars? Do you see the same sort of of cruelty on the same scale? Or or, or was there something that made the Mongols no, you particularly see, brutal? Was there some you see, reason you see, for it? You see elements of of this you know all these battlefield atrocities everywhere. But with the Mongols, you have and again this is going to be repeated by another figure we're going to be talking about later on, the figure of Tamale who very much tries to um, emulate the Mongol strategy in this way. But you have to remember that Genghis Khan embarked upon nothing short of world conquest, so much so that upon his death in 1227, believing that he had not completed the, you know, the full conquest of the world, he believed himself to be a failure. So what the Mongols are trying to achieve is something unprecedented in world history. They are trying to rapidly take over the world in basically a couple of generations, and they're consciously thinking, <laughs> thinking of things in that way. And so the deliberate strategy of terror is realizing that the fundamental weakness of the Mongols is in delaying conflict through prolonged sieges, essentially. So the systemic use of terror in the way that you destroy a city which has either you know killed the envoy therefore broken the golden rule or refused to surrender is a way of actually accelerating the conquest by terrorizing other cities into surrendering without a fight therefore enabling this um this idea of world conquest but um regardless of you know whether that was the intention or not when it came to the rus very few of the cities actually surrendered so you talked about how um Ryazan had been abandoned by the other Rus, and this is important to mention, after the decimation of the Rus nobility at the Battle of Kalka, rather than organizing, again, reuniting as they had under um, Yaroslav the Wise, the Rus princes returned to their bickering and their interstate fighting. Ryazan in particular was constantly at war with the Grand Prince of Vladimir um, at the time, one Yuri II. And I think it also should be emphasized that, you know, Kiev also has lost its political preeminence since 1169, since the city yeah, was so sacked. Yes, it's been broken by this point, yeah. Yes, 
and um, it's not it's still there but um and it has some sort of um, spiritual significance but the power the most powerful of the princes is that of Vladimir Suzdal in the north um just north of the city of Ryazan and because he fails this is Yuri II because he fails to support um Ryazan his habitual enemy um, all it does is enable the Mongols to conquer the Rus far more easily because they're already a divided people who even after the shock of Kalka River haven't united. So um, Yuri II is killed at the, um, the Battle of the Sit River after the, um, the brief siege of um, Vladimir. And with the fall of the Grand Prince of, of Vladimir, the Mongols then proceed to sack other cities in the north of the Rus. So, uh, the first campaign is the north, as you can see. So these would be cities such as... Um, uh, Yaroslav, such as Rostov, such as Tver, such as Skelich, and of course the um, the city of Moscow, which had only really been a town at this point, but the first city of Moscow is completely um, raised to the ground. The important exception, which we'll get onto later when we talk about Alexander Nevsky, is of course the cities of Skov and the cities of Novgorod, which again, falling in line with this tactic of terror, surrender preemptively to the Mongols and therefore their cities are spared. And again, for the Mongol strategy, seeing the preferential treatment bestowed upon cities that surrender and the fact they're not going to be destroyed is again, as a deliberate part of the strategy to again, coerce these cities into surrendering without a fight. Again, the um, the old Sun Tzu adage of the supreme art of war is in subduing the enemy without fighting, etc. But this is the, um, the first campaign. The second campaign is directed through the south and it's directed first of all through the Crimea, um, eliminating the elements of the Kumans and the Kipchaks, which are still occupying the steppe during this point, because the Mongols had again largely departed this area. And after subjugating the Kipchaks and the Kumans, again basically establishing a Mongol power center in the south at the, the confluence of the Don and the, um, the Volga rivers, um, the Mongols go through and sack what is now, you know, the modern state of Ukraine. They first of all they attack Chernigov, one of the great principalities, and destroy it. Then they get to Kiev itself and raise it to the ground in 1240. Then they keep moving forwards. So they by 1239. Um, and just to they, just to, just to give a, an idea of the scale of the destruction of Kiev, I mean there are, there's a later description from I think around a hundred years later, and it's described as having about. 200 families or something absurd you know and, and of course the chronicle might exaggerate but i mean i mean perhaps it doesn't i mean this is the mongols we're talking about no i don't think it does exaggerate actually because 200 families let's assume that's some um, 1000 to 2000 people the city of kiev only had a population of about 40000 if that when the mongols arrived so probably had a population smaller than that say you know, between 20 and 30000 so the idea that 90% of the population would have been eliminated is with in the the bounds of possibility considering it's, again how yeah it, it's worth mentioned in the year 238 to 239 that 14 of these major cities across Rus lands are attacked and raised to the ground syst systematically and because they choose to resist they're more or less murdered to a man um the campaign is extremely thorough and um and uh, another thing I wanted to mention too is when uh, when Ryzen actually initially falls, um, the brother of the prince, um, Prince Roman, escapes actually north to Prince Yuri um, Vizelovich um, of the of Vladimir Sudzdal. And when um, the Mongols attempt to chase him down, one of the royal family, uh, one Kolgen, is actually killed in a skirmish. So very early on, a Essentially, a, a Gengisid, a noble, is killed in a skirmish, which basically takes peace off the table as well, because now it's become personal for them. Hmm. And I mean, they were. I mean, t to my mind, they were never going to make peace anyway. I mean, if you look at the the grand scale no, of the conflict, of course. Yeah. I mean, um, first of all, you know, they go on from Kiev and take over um, uh, Volodymyr Volinsky, which is right at the periphery in what is now modern day Ukraine, separating you know the um, the Grand Duchy of Poland from basically the vicinity of the Rus peoples and they don't stop there they've now basically subjugated the Rus into you know through a combination of you know, annihilation tactics and terror in the case of Novgorod and they move further into Poland and they defeat the combined armies of all the um, the Dukes of Poland, the Dukes of Silesia, the Dukes of Bessovia, and of course the, the Grand Duke of Poland at the Battle of Leibniz and um, kill the Duke of Poland Henry the Pious and then they go further and, they move and into and other isn't there a Teutonic night um, segment of that order as well? 
at that battle? Yes. All of the all of these elements here, the Teutonic Knights again are invariably um, at conflict with the Golden Horde. But that doesn't again that they're not slowing down. They move into the Hungarian plain now. And um at the Battle of Mohi, it's one of the um most decisive military victories, you know, ever inflicted against the Hungarians ever. Um we have estimates that not only was the, you know, the the entire sort of Hungarian nobility wiped out by that, the King of Hungary also, um, I think Bella the Fourth was um slain at that battle. But um, the Mongols then, throughout 1241, essentially, went on a continuous loot and pillage train throughout Hungary. Of course, once you've occupied the center of the Pannonian Basin, there is very little in terms of defensible land structures, apart from, again, the Carpathian Mountains in the east, which they've already circumvented. And so the Hungarian countryside was basically laid waste. And yeah. we have potentially, you know, a third of the country potentially dying as a sort of this um, individual conflict, just to, again, to emphasize the scale of it. Yes, and I think I think the figures for the Rus are something like 500,000 killed as well. Mm. And, 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 and um, there are some remarkable, I mean, I mean, some of the towns are so, so laid waste that there, I mean, there's a, there's a story about one town, I think it's called Kitets. Uh, I'm not exactly her, um, sure how to pronounce it, but the story goes that it had no fortifications and the Mongols came to it and all of the, all of the people in the city, um, which was on a lake, I think, um, were praying fervently for salvation. And apparently the entire city sank into the lake. And it's still a sort of folk tale in Russia. You know, that if you're a pious person and you walk along the lake, you might see lights at the bottom of the shore. Things like this, you know, so it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's a fascinating um, time. And also, there's the the uh, the defense of uh, Kozelsk by the the uh, twelve year old boy prince Vasily of Chernigov. <laughs> yeah, he lasts there for like no. weeks. <laughs> uh, two two months. Um, they basically lead like sortie. They actually attack like the Mongol siege works in the middle of the night with the citizen militia and incinerate the trebuchets, and it's extremely Fantastic. daring. The the Mongols are actually so distraught. Um, I mean, they murder everyone. They kill the city literally to the soul. Uh, but the Mongols scrub. Uh, any reference to the city from their record, and they refer. And whenever anyone raises or, or mentions the term Kozelsk, they call it the evil place, and that's the only epithet they give the locality. Mm. You do get that though, because um, I mean, a prolonged siege will always become particularly grim. But if you're faced with a Indeed. with daring, you know, sorties like that, it makes the situation even worse. Indeed. Yeah. Yes, and obviously moving on to that, um, then we get to the strategy of obviously the Mongols slow down from their um, essential occupation of Hungary throughout the year of 1241. They begin raiding the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire. They get as far as, you know, Meissen in Germany. They, of course, attack um, Austria at the same time. They move into Croatia. They move into Serbia. They move into Bulgaria and they begin to subjugate, you know, vast swathes of the, um, the Danube Basin. However, at the end of 1241, in December of 1241, the great Khan Ogadai dies. And traditionally, this is used as the, again, the pretext for ending the original invasion. Um, I'll explain that for, you know, in my estimate, various reasons. Um, Ogadai, of course, had been committed to fulfilling the legacy of his father, namely world conquest. And so it therefore shouldn't come as any surprise that the principal general, who wasn't a Gengishid prince, Subutai, was also wanting to press the advance further into Europe. Again, the assumption that had the Mongols moved west, they wouldn't have been able to, you know, face any significant resistance to the Atlantic, which I think is very dubious considering during the, the nature of the terrain and given the fact the Mongols had already endured significant losses up until this point and again just maintaining a already when we see the the, the scale of the advance the fact that they've basically been able to decimate um, Poland the fact they've been able to decimate Hungary the fact they've been able to subjugate the risk principalities the idea of continuously marching west being whittled down undermining their numbers of which of course the Mongols were always virtually always outnumbered by their enemies and they had to rely on speed of course the more concentrated populations of fortresses I mean there are arguments yes. which are less, and of course less it's also insane. it's also inevitable that uh, in my opinion that a state of such size is going to the fighting is going to turn inwards at some point you know very and it does, it, yes, and it does, and it does, yeah. and it does this immediately I mean there are some more spurious arguments made against this the idea that the the Mongols weren't um uh you know applicable to the climate in Western Europe but anyone who says that just needs to point to the fact that the Mongols under Kublai Khan successfully conquered Song Dynasty China which you yeah, know it, is, it gets it gets cold on the steps I mean it pretty much alternates between extreme cold and extreme heat so, so, the so fact, these so guys the are pretty that, tough you know so the fact that they're able to um take over Song Dynasty China which again if you imagine the, the jungles of southern China compared to the Gobi Desert, you know, there's really nothing in terms of comparison. In fact, again, you talked about the, the Mongols 
this is basically being the equivalent of the Borg when it, when it comes to the Yuan dynasty, or do the Mongols then become experts? So they become experts at amphibious naval warfare at the same time, in terms of how versatile <laughs> yeah, yeah. they've been. So in terms of this argument is the Mongols couldn't conquer Europe. I, I don't really believe that. I do, I'm much more inclined to believe that the Mongols simply had no reason to conquer Europe. I mean, if you look at it within the strategic planning of the supreme commander in Europe, which is Batu Khan, um, once... Batu Khan, of course, hears that um, uh, Ogadai has died. Now it is a matter of convening the Kurultai, the military council, to elect the new Khan. And Batu, basically believing that he has no chance of being elected the um, elected the Supreme Khan, um, makes an interesting decision. Rather than going back to Karakoram, the capital of the Mongol Empire, he returns to the Volga River and begins to set up a his own independent base of power there. And this is going on during the course of, of basically a five year interregnum within the Mongol Empire. It's not until um, 1246 that uh, Gyuk Khan, the um, the son of Ogadai, is elected, you know, and that in itself sort of creates a civil war which isn't resolved until you have the election of Mon Kerr, um, five years after that. But um, the fact that all of these princes are again, they're consciously thinking about their um, their positions of power and you know whether it's going to be a, as part of a, you know the cruel tie, the election, or whether in the case of Batu Khan, it's about consolidating my own possession. These are all important political, practical considerations to make beyond just the sake of conquering Europe for the sake of conquering Europe, other than that of, you know, raiding and taking um, significant plunder to return home without enduring significant losses. So um, therefore, I think it's quite understandable if you look at Batu Khan, you know, what's he wanting to do? Batu Khan is wanting to establish a new base of power in Russia. And if you look at the potential threats to Russia now, what are the potential threats? Well, the Byzantine Empire has already been thoroughly reduced by the Fourth Crusade. You know, it, it basically yeah. doesn't exist at this point. It's the, the Latin, time of the Latin Empire. Empire. Right. The yeah. yes, the Arsene dynasty of Bulgaria again is basically just a um, a pawn of the Francocratia. Hungary has been defeated. The Livonian Knights and the Teutonic Knights have been defeated in battle. The Polish have been defeated. Yeah, you know, with the exception possibly of the Swedish, who are a bigger threat to Novgorod who's basically acts as a buffer state to the Mongols in the north. There are no military threats against the Mongols other than the Mongols to themselves. Okay. So um, to, to Batu Khan, therefore, you know, he's basically solidified the basis of his new rule, which will become the And so the does Batu Horde. Khan set up his own Karakoram, so to speak, you know, his, yes, uh, his and, own capital? Yes, this gets to the um, the next slide, which is the creation of the of the Golden Horde and, you know, what becomes of the um, the the great Mongol Empire after the um, the conquest of Europe. Well, in 1243, as I mentioned, he returns to the Volga River. He doesn't return to Karakorum. And he organizes what in Turkish is known as the Altan Order, which is loosely translated as the, the Golden Tent, meaning, of course, the command tent of the, the Mongol general. But that would soon, you know, earn an appellation as the Golden Horde, referring to the armies of the um, the armies of what what in Mongol you refer to these areas as the Ulus or the country or the nation. Yeah. So as you can see here on this map, by the time we get to the death of Mongol Khan, which is a bit later than what the period we're talking about, um, the empire had effectively split into four centers of regional power under Mongol dynasts. So in the case of um, the uh, the Ilkhanate in Iran, that was under Hulagu. With the case of the Central Asia, that was under the sons of Chagatai Khan. And then, of course, we had the Jokid dynasty under Batu Khan, and all of his sons would then inherit this um, position of power and therefore hegemony over the Rus principalities, but exercising, yeah. you know, direct power over Central Asia. But even then, you yeah, because the, they're taking over you know, prior prior modes of administration, right? That's why you have the the Mongol dynasty in China continue for so long because they capture the Chinese administration. Well, yes, that, that that that's more of a of a different question. I mean, because of course, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll get into that slightly later when we get to the Tul uh, Tuluid civil war. But just as it pertains to um, uh, to Batu Khan, um, Batu Khan, as you mentioned, he establishes his own version of Karakoram, and this um, town is provisionally referred to as Sarai, which is, if, if you think of it in a map. It doesn't exist anymore, obviously, but it's roughly corresponding to Volgograd or what used to be called um, um, Stalingrad, that area around the Volga River, this strategic location, again, crossing the um, the major um, waterway of Russia. It's, it's a little north, but it is in a, uh, in an, a part of that uh, confluence with the Don and the Volga come very close together. So mm. a very opportune point to control all of the trade and what have you. And also defensible, but yes. 
Mm. Well, principally, uh, it doesn't become a you know a flourishing sort of mar a merchant town immediately. This sort of be becomes the case when the Mongols establish a more sedentary administration under Osberg, which we'll talk about later. But um, yes. as of now, Sarai is sort of content to take tribute, right? Hmm. As of now, Sarai is basically in Persian. It means like the palace or the court. So, so basically, it is just the assembly of, of the administration of, of the horde. And of course, this is in the strategic strategic location where the um, the Don, the Volga River, is closest. And in twelve four three. Batu, basically setting himself up as ruler of Russia, orders the submission of the Rus princes. You know, now, now he's formally creating a new sense of administration. Um, Yaroslav II, who had been the brother of Yuri II, who had died um, uh, during during the invasion, uh, immediately submits to the um, to the authority of Batu Khan. And again, Batu Khan isn't exercising this as, uh, directly as an independent sovereign. He's still technically a vassal of the um, of, of the Mongol emperor. Essentially, in this case, it'll eventually be Guyuku, even though there isn't um, a Mongol emperor at this point. But um, eff effectively, he's independent in all but name. This is a form of de facto independence, and this is quite an interesting point in you know how the the russian princes react to this idea that they're now having to recognize this long form of um mongol domination over their territory as i mentioned yaroslav ii um immediately surrenders and in return for this his title of the grand prince of vladimir is retained and in this way he is essentially the um the primus inter paris of all the russian princes he is there to ensure that among the russian princes the other russian princes don't stay out don't you know walk out of line he's responsible for ensuring that they pay tribute to the Mongols. So basically they set up a ruler to rule Russia for them whilst they effectively so dominate like sort of militarily. Suzerain. Yes, he's basically, well, you, you, you can say he's like a supreme vassal of, mm. um, you know, the, the Mongols are they're much stronger than suzerains. They're extracting Russia for slaves. They're extracting Russia for resources, and they will continually raid into the weaker Rus principalities, um, you know, who are not paying tribute. The threat of violence is always hanging over the Rus principalities. But the idea is that if you have a, a loyal um, subject in the form of the Grand Prince of Vladimir operating basically as the, as the um, you know, a local Russian ruler operating as the mongol enforcer is going to put up a lot less resistance when the mongols are wanting to extract yes. as much tribute with as little effort as possible yes and, and in terms of you mentioned they need to be loyal i i mean what that's one thing that i was really uh, i picked up on when you're talking about vladimir and then later muscovy as well um is they really pick up on um um mongol traditions many of them even take on mongol names and i think um mm -hmm. Um, you know, there were studies done. I think maybe in the in the seventeen hundreds, and and it was something like um ten percent or fifteen percent of the the Russian nobility had and um, could in some way um, link their 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 lineage all the way back to some Mongol prince or Mongol lord. Um, and so this gives you an idea of you know because this is a long period we're talking about, and it, there was a lot of um um cultural intermeshing there, and they they really left an impact. I mean, they even um. Um, there were certain forces uh, and certain institutions set up during the Mongol yoke. I think there was a postage service and things like this, and they were sort of um, um, yeah. taken taken over um, by the Russians later on. So they they left a deep impact. Yes, and of course you're referring to the Yam system, the postal system, which um, accelerated trade throughout you know all of um, Eurasia, all the way from um, Song Dynasty China um, into Europe, which proved so um, pivotal in the the Mongols maintaining such a you know effective economic and um, military control through the use of the the postal network. But just um, uh, building upon that that point, Columba. Um, the, the the Rus princes actually became part of this um you know internal part of Mongol Mongol politics because of course the um the faction of Ogadai who are now planning to put um Guyuku as the great Khan over Batu are now concerned that Batu is essentially creating this um vast independent source of power. And um they then demand briefly that the Russian princes have to go all the way to Karakorum to pay um, homage to the great Khan in person rather than doing it through their proxy in Sarai to Batu Khan. In the case of um, Yaroslav II, he arrives at Karakorum and he, he is then subsequently um, murdered, poisoned by organized wi widow and um, regent of her son, uh, Guyuku, uh, Torigeni. Again, because the idea is that um, Yaroslav II is actually useful to Batu. He's um, ensuring his reign and his domination over the Rus principalities. So it's an attempt to destabilize 
Batu Khan's yes, situation. Yes, yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. And um, this is, I mean, Batu Khan is very clever in the way he, you know, goes about this and how he's able to survive and how he's able to rise to being essentially the second man within the Mongol Empire. They're um, all so devious. <laughs> Such a rogues gallery. Yes. Well, within them, um, we, we talked about the conquest. Well, of course, what one of the effects of the conquest we already had the decimation of the nobility with the battle of Kalka river now with the destruction of so many cities so many russian aristocrats and members of the russian royalty have become physically dispossessed of their own territories you know the ones who actually survived the invasion and so after 1241 when the mongols you know begin returning back there is a return of many exiled nobles. I mean, in particular, one Michael of Chernigov, who was one of the three great princes along with um, Yaroslav II. And in order for Batu to solidify his own control, he invests himself with the, um, uh, with the power of uh, the Yalik, which basically means the right to bestow patrimony. So in order for any Russian prince to have any nominal control over this you know, new vast territory, which is under the auspices of the Golden Horde, he now has to beg Batu Khan to receive that patrimony. So basically, the Russian princes come to him, they get conferred you know, with, with a new territory, and then they go back and administer it on behalf of the Mongols. So this way, again, all power is centralized nominally in, in the sovereignty of the person of, um, of Batu Khan. Um, Michael Chernigov, comes back after again being driven out of um, um, his hometown of Chernigov, being driven out of um, Kiev, uh, being forced into exile in um, Silesia. And then he finally returns after all of this devastation. And again, this is a man who um, originally fought at the Battle of um, Kalka River as a junior prince of Novgorod. And now he's returning back after the complete devastation of his homeland. And he believes because, you know, there isn't that much resistance to the return of the rich princes because they serve a vital function for Batu Khan, that um, he will be basically confirmed in his old position. Well, of course, no, he has to go and submit himself formally to Batu Khan at Sarai. And in complete contrast to Yaroslav II, just to emphasize that this isn't all a complete, you know, subjugation of the Rus. Um, Michael of Chernigov very famously comes to Batu Khan and uh, beforehand he had also sought alliance with the Hungarians. He has sought an alliance with various Western factions again to help him. And of course, as we mentioned, Batu Khan has now destroyed all of these independent powers. So there is no source of military help to um, to save um, a more independent minded ruler such as um, Michael of Chernigov again. So he goes to, um, to Sarai again to parlay for the return of his principality and his rights. And there he is forced to formally submit to Batu Khan. And also, I think in the, the image, if I show it quickly, which was the, um, the thumbnail of this stream, uh, to pay homage to the shrine of Genghis Khan, who basically the Mongols, you know, worship, uh, have some elements of idol worship, some uh, elements of um, ancestor worth yeah. worship, some elements of, ta um, of Taoism, some elements of Buddhism, all these syncretic elements together. But the cult of Genghis also, Khan in particular, sorry, Marcus, go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, for, for the for the Mongols and given their sort of meteoric, or, meteoric rise and given the life of Genghis Khan and that Genghis still would have been quite vivid in the imagination of the of the average Mongol warrior and certainly of the of the Genghis family, that he would almost have been you know, kind of kind of the the mongol julius caesar in a sense like he sort of almost sort of transcended himself and yeah, being sort so of deified. It, it, it's an imperial cult yeah and it's, it's mm, serving mm -hmm. the exact same purpose to to try and yes. homogenize the 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 new yeah. acquisitions yeah like, well, like well, the literally case of someone yeah but someone literally becoming legendary just after they've died not like not Eight, not down the ages, but literally they die, they become a legend. It's almost that instantaneous. Yes, and it's not so much, um, you know, a total homogenization. Of course, like the Romans, they will allow um, provinces or, or, or the different peoples of the empire to have their own particular tr um, traditions. But the importance of an imperial cult is it's a sort of a, a touchstone of loyalty. You know, it, it, it's the measure by which you will get people to swear oaths and declare loyalty. And it's a unifying force in that sense. It's a unifying I mean, sovereignty. Yeah. And it can be used think, as a propaganda weapon as well for the for the regime, if I may use that word. Yes, I think just in terms, I mean, I agree absolutely with everything you're saying, Columba. And I think this this conscious association of an imperial cult for the empire is very important. But unlike the Romans, the Mongols didn't come in and they didn't build cities. They didn't have a uniform culture they wanted to impose 
in the world. You know, of course, they did. Genghis Khan was responsible for many, you know, innovations, including the Mongol legal system, the creation of the Mongol alphabet, etc. But many of the Mongol Uluses were eventually assimilated into the cultures they conquered rather than the other way around. And they simply began to dominate over the regions they conquered. And the unifying symbol of Genghis was very important to the, the Mongol power and the Mongol prestige and of course the dynasty itself, you know, the the various sons. But in terms of the, them that actually representing some sort of Roman form of homogenizing cultural and legal power, um, no. Uh, no yeah, that's nothing, going too far. That, that's going too far. But, but nevertheless, the imperial cult is an important thing to say. And when it comes to Michael of um, uh, Chernigov, of course, um, he's forced again to go through all these various rituals. For example, when meeting the Khan, um, the Khan, the Mongols, one actually has to pass through fire. You know, you, you see this later with um, Metropolitan Alexis when he um, cures the blindness of um, uh, Yanabeg's mother, that you have um, all of these, you know, um, again, strange elements, these strange rituals for, for, again, a Christian ruler who is supposed to observe. Now he's basically having to submit himself for um, under the tutelage of Genghis Khan, and he refuses to submit himself to Genghis. He refuses to submit himself to Batu Khan, and for it, as you can see on this image, he is um, murdered there and then, along with his um, his retinue. Again, to make an example to the pre to the um, princes of the empire who do not submit, unlike Yaroslav II, who was rewarded and given the position, you know, restored his rank of um, Grand Prince of Vladimir. Um, another equally prominent prince, um, Michael of Chernigov, uh, lost everything and was destroyed, and all of his you know family were wiped out at the same time. So again, the Mongols, as we um, we see with Novgorod, if you surrender to them, they will be kind to you. But if you resist them in any way, they will destroy everything about you. And this again is an interesting thing, the theme we're going to touch upon when we're talking about how the Russians dealt with um, their conquerors. It's this this towing the line between, you know, a, a, basically a, obsequiousness and subservience to a military hegemon, yet on the other end, trying to retain some vet vestige of independence, whether that be, you know, political or religious or cultural, etc. But going back to the um the slide we had before, which is about, you know, what happened, you know, within the Mongol Empire at the same time, you know, did it disintegrate effectively quickly? Well, no, it was a long process of, um, you could say, slow decentralization rather than disintegration, one which really accelerates in the um, the middle of the, the 14th century. So um, Batu Khan, as I mentioned, was one of the most um, effective politicians of the of the early Mongol Empire. Having already established his own base of power, he held on to it whilst his enemy, Guyuku, occupied the position of Great Khan. And when he died, he organized his comrade in arms, um, Monka Khan, who had played again a pivotal role in the conquest of the Rus and the invasion of Europe to be elected as the new Great Khan. And and therefore, with his allies, the new great Khan, Monka Khan, acknowledged Batu Khan and all of his possessions and his overlordship of the Rus, therefore you know, guaranteeing the Golden Horde of rule over Russia um, indirectly for the next 200 years. I think it's also important to note that Monka Khan was probably the last united great Khan who was, like Ogodai Khan, organizing mm. these grand world-changing conquests everywhere at the same time. Well, so I suppose Mon once, you, once you give away um, sort of um, sovereignty to Batu Khan like that. The the idea of a sort of unified empire has already been dealt a lethal blow. Well, again, it's the idea that, at least to the Mongols, um, the idea was at least nominal fealty, uh, fealty to a central ruler, even though the Mongols couldn't exercise the form of direct bureaucratic reach for a single ruler. They had to do it through a network of patronage. They had to do it through a network of family alliances. And during the reign of Monka, that system was retained because of the personal familial alliance between um, Monka and Batu. And as I said, you know, this also, you, you could say is the last, again, concerted period of vast Mongol conquest. So in China, you have the um, conquest of the kingdom of Dali under the auspices of Kublai Khan, even though the Mongols are yet to conquer the Song dynasty. And at the same time, this is in the year 1258, the Mongols are invading um, Mesopotamia and they sack the city of Baghdad, basically er eradicating the um, last temporal vestige of the Abbasid Caliphates, which then have to submit themselves to the, um, to the rule of the um, Mamluk sultans in Egypt, which are the only power in the region who are actively able to stop the advance of the Mongols even further into the Levant. Can we mm. touch on the fate of the last Abbasid leader, just very briefly? 
Um, when you're referring to the last Abbasid um, leader, I think it's important to note that the Abbasid Caliphate existed for some 250 years as as essentially um, the the pawns of the Mamluk sultans. But uh, if you're, yes, if you're referring to the last um, the, the actual the last yes, yes. yeah. Yeah. So, so just for the for the benefit of the chat, if they would, if they like a yarn, um, the I can't remember, I can't, I can't exactly remember how it came about, but to my recollection, I think the the, the there was a threat made to the the city and and to the to the caliph that um, if we capture your city, we will murder your population and uh, we'll kill you. But there was some kind of a prophecy, and I I, I do apologize, I, I didn't. Think this would come up so i didn't research it but there was some kind of a, a prophecy or foretelling that the 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 great khan or the family of the khan couldn't shed the blood of the caliph or sort of that would be that would be sort of forever cursed so rather than actually executing the caliph when they had captured baghdad which is one of the most thorough and comprehensive destructions of a of a civilized city in history that the, the the ruination of baghdad is monumental yeah. this did really they not, um, did not the... fire fire heads over the walls and things like that yes yeah. it's like they, they lit fire to to the skulls and, and threw them over the walls like it was it was, a, it was they intimidated the population relentlessly and so when they eventually captured baghdad they captured the young caliph rather than executing him as they would have done or say as as the picture that uh, uh, apostolic there showed of the the grand prince um what they actually do is they roll him up in a giant carpet and um and, and the and the the mongols have the entire have the general's bodyguard gallop over this rug and they crush him to death so basically implying that a we didn't technically cut him we didn't you know kill him in in the, the in a face-to-face -face sense and secondly which horse and which hoof and which rider actually kills him? It's become so ambiguous. But in 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 order to avert the the curse, so to speak, that's the very interesting and ingenious way they try and circumvent this this proposed curse is by rolling him up on a carpet and mm. and, tr and and galloping on him to death. So does such a does such a prophecy or, or or curse does this imply some sort of respect for the Muslim religion on behalf of the Mongols or or, or at least some. So, yes, yeah, some some awareness there. Of course, there's awareness, but but I mean, what does that signify there? Uh, I, I think I think it goes to show that even the most powerful of men can sometimes have a superstitious superstitious streak to them. Um, I'd, I'd have to look up the actual origin of it. Like I said, I didn't realize it was going to come up, so I didn't actually research. I just know about it from having come across it once or twice in books. But um, uh, it can be part of what you're saying is I, I think indicative of the fact that. This occurs, obviously Baghdad is, is in Mesopotamia, it's in modern day Iraq. And we can see on the map here that Baghdad ends up becoming part of the Ilkhanate. And the Ilkhanate is the first sub-regime, it's the first breakaway part of the of the Mongol Empire that actually becomes Islamic. I mean, for yes, instance, I was going to bring that up, yeah. it becomes a, essentially an Islamic Khan um it, mm. when when he takes power. And we will get to Tamerlane obviously in the in the future stream, but that that it's hard to know whether Islam has has entered the consciousness of the Mongols at the point of the siege of Baghdad. But you're right, Columbus. It's an interesting question, and um, I know I'll, I'll research it. Maybe we can touch on it in the next stream. The next time we touch on the Ilkhanate, but it, it is um, Indeed. it is interesting to find out. Mm. Yes. Um. Again, to to avoid us going too much into a tangent, I'll just briefly summarise. You know what happened to the Mongol Empire. So. To my mind, at least, the pivotal event which um, begins the disunification of the Mongol Empire into these um, these Ulus or these nations, as you can see on this map, these four principal nations, is the death of Monka Khan in 1259. Um, the first sort of impetus of that is the Tolawid civil war between Arik Boka and, and uh, Kublai Khan. And this is simply because, you know, Arik Boka, again, is attempting to rule in the, the manner of a Ogadai or a Monka or a, um, or a Genghis Khan, the, the world conquering um, leader, whereas Kublai Khan now uh, basically one of the contenders to be great Khan and he wins that civil war in 1264 and has this nominal authority over the other you know elements of the empire but again only really nominal um he wants to establish himself as a emperor in china he wants to be he is becoming increasingly sinicized he's moved his capital away from karakorum to xanadu and from xanadu he'll move it even further south to um Kambalik, which is you know yes. was xanadu not the, the sort of summer residence yes precisely yeah. and um Dardu 
Chengdu, of course, being the, the basis of the modern day city of Beijing. And from that position, from 1264 until 1278, Kublai Khan will focus all of his efforts essentially in conquering and subjugating the Song dynasty in China. And from that point on, he becomes the Yuan Emperor. So basically, you could say the the, you, you know, the Ilkhanate, you know, but the first state to become Islamicized, you could say the Yuan state was the first state that ceased to be Mongol, in the sense that even though the Mongol, the Mongol dynasty retained this um, strata, this upper strata, this upper echelon, this elite rank within um, uh, Yuan society, they began to consciously they mimic all the governmental styles and administration and even the um the confucian bureaucracy and the um exam yeah. system in um of song dynasty china so <laughs> it'd be interesting to see how the mongols adapted to the exam system <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is the thing. I mean, you don't, you have a military elite, you have a royal elite, and you just rely on local Chinese to be the experts in Confucius, etc. You don't um, need the Mongols to actually partake in this system, because as with everything, they simply dominated the regimes. They were never again, they were always a tiny population. So they were only able to dominate, they weren't able to conquer, colonize and consolidate in the way that the Romans were able to. But as this pertains to the rest of the empire, because this is specifically talking about um, the principal power of the Mongols, which was in China. Um, what also happens is that when Batu Khan dies in 1259, you know, roughly corresponding to the death of Monka Khan, his ally, um, his set successor, Burka Khan, begins a protracted war over um, the Caucasus with Hulagu, the Ilkhan. So now within the, um, the Ulysses themselves, there is now conflict over these territories. And this war over the Caucasus, um, Azerbaijan in particular, is going to be something which we constantly get back to. And in the end will be the undoing of the Golden Horde when we get to Tamerlane. But I think it's important to note that even though the Mongol Empire is beginning to fracture, um, the Golden Horde is still organizing these massive invasions westwards. So under the um, Golden Horde potentate of Nogai Khan, from 1285 to 1287, um, an army of 30,000 men is organized to invade Hungary and invade Poland and even invade um, Bulgaria in a second invasion of Europe. Um, however, this time, the Hungarians and the Polish are used to Mongol raids. They've been enduring them, you know, consistently for 45 years. Um, the cities such as Krakow are much more heavily fortified. And the Mongols actually suffer far more casualties than the Hungarians or the Polish do. And of course, this wasn't also meant to be a, um, a, a matter of conquest either. This was supposed to be a, um, a, a vast raid, essentially, to acquire resources. Mm -hmm. so, and also, I think it's important it, to It's one of the reasons for um, for these failures, AM, is it because um, um, not only are the cities more fortified, but it's more, dif more difficult to lay siege to a city because um, the settlement density of of europe is is so much more than than what you have in the in the steppe or even in the rus states you know um so 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 um european states can european forces can more easily come to each other's aid would you would you consider that as an important factor well, bear in mind that the Mongols were able to effortlessly, effortlessly take over these areas only only 40 years before. We're not talking about, you know, um, uh, densely populated Western Europe. We're still talking about Poland, which had, again, Hungary especially had basically been emptied by the original conquest. I think what's important to note is that when we had the invasion with Ogadai, the Mongols were essentially unified under Subutai strategy, but again, under the Great Khan. And of course, with the death of Ogadai, we begin to see the disunification of the Mongol Empire. While well, we're talking about the disunification of the, um, the nations of the, of the Mongol Empire, but within the, um, the Golden Horde itself, after the death of Burka Khan, um, the contenders, the Jokic princes, begin to fight amongst themselves. And so, as I mentioned, Nogai Khan is just a potentate. He's a general who is trying to rule, you know, in tandem with the princes. And, and if anything, this raid is a confirmation of his authority, but he's deliberately undermined by his own men because he doesn't have the same authority which a, a Subutai or a Batu Khan had during the original conquest. So from the beginning, he's betrayed. And of course, when these operations do fail by 1287 and he returns, he has to fight off a protracted civil war against Tokta Khan. I see. <laughs> I, I uh, just to go back to where we were just for a second. I think they're saying what Columbus said about <clears throat> the the military technology and the geography of the West. It's so far that if you look at uh, your point about uh, the previous campaign is is very true, apostolic. You know they they had swept in under under in the previous invasion um, and had brought great ruins of Poland and Hungary. But I think the Euro Europeans, because of their 
very close proximity to one another had been used to fighting you might say a more diverse host of enemies and the europeans at this point this is sort of towards the end of the crusader period but many europeans had um had as knights fought in the, the the middle east and the near east and um and had gone back to europe and there'd been this transfer of technology you know via byzantium via the the, the the caliphs back to europe and and then having come into contact with the mongols and sort of learning and adapting to a new form of fighting i think doubtless um that is a factor in, in its own right. B, in the case of the the Kiev and Rus and the, the the Russian principalities, we did canvas uh, in the previous stream that essentially they built their cities and the defences out of sort of timber and earthworks and such construction. It's good for keeping sheep inside of your settlement, but it's not exactly good for keeping boulders and stones <laughs> out out so to speak. And and the 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 fortification density and the fortification strength of Europe is much greater. And I think with them having fought the Mongols in in the prior campaign, uh, when they're attacked uh, with this uh, this force, did you say it was thirty or forty thousand apostolic? Thereabouts, thirty thousand. I think they're far more able to deal with that. And Going on to what Columbus said about the cities, uh, in the end, if you look at the concentration of settlements in Europe, you know it's not as if the Mongols could attack a city like Ryzan or um, or Chernogov and then post centuries 20, 30 kilometers away, and it's a vast plain and you can see everything from every direction. I mean, if you're attacking if you're attacking cities such as you know Budapest, for instance, you know it's uh, Budapest is not far from yeah. Yeah. Uh, from you know the It's and much all, harder to scout it's, and and be secure. Oh, yeah. That map's per perfect. Yeah, you know, sort of you know, Edstagom is not hugely far away from Krakow as, as an example. Um, uh, it, it, the ability of, of, of towns to support each other with garrisons or with levies is, is, is far easier. And also the infrastructure exists. You know, Euro Europeans would have, we're not talking Roman roads, obviously, but would have a, a more sophisticated, more dense road system than they would have had in the Kievan rules, as an example. Um, and, and so the ability to sort of harass um, at the supply lines of the Mongols and to deprive them of um, the ability to, to nourish your horses and, and, to, and to feed on, on grassland and what have you without being, um, without being perpetually harassed and without being sort of constantly teased, let's say, upon the periphery of their, of their army is um, I think the Europeans have a much better capacity for this. And this is why I think for a whole collection of reasons, as I've just mentioned, they're able to endure the second invasion um, with um with much more success than they did initially. So what's next? <laughs> Here we go. Alexander Nevsky looks like. Have we lost the? Um... Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, we... oh, sorry, no. sorry, sorry, I'm back. So, um, so moving on, if that's all right, from the the Mongol conquest, um, we'll move to the what, how essentially was Russia ruled um, during during this period. We mentioned um, the administration of the the Golden Horde and the fact that the Mongols dominated. Well, what actually happened within Russia itself? So, this is a case study of two people. I've included Alexander Nevsky, but the opposite of him is um, uh, Daniel of Halich, which make quite interesting um, comparisons as to how to deal with a, a foreign conqueror, essentially. So with Alexander Nevsky, he is the son of the aforementioned Yaroslav II, who had been murdered by um, Ogdai's widow and had, you know, submitted to the Mongols in um, 1243. You know, he had been Prince of Novgorod since um, 1238, again appointed by his father after the death of um, Yuri II. And in 1240, this is the same time as the, um, the Mongol invasion, we have a, another invasion in the north which is the Swedish invasion of the Republic of Novgorod, which he is, again, the, the supreme executive as its commander. Even though, as we mentioned on previous streams, Novgorod had basically become a, um, a de facto republic with a, um, a ruling prince of their own choice. And using um, Alexander Nevsky, Alexander Nevsky, he was only um, 19 at the time, um, defeated the Swedes at the Battle of Neva, earning his epithet of Nevsky. And um, what was the response of the, the Republic? Um, they were fearful that Novgorod could have potentially lapsed back into becoming a principality like um, Vladimir Sustal. So they then deposed him yes. only to um, recall him um, a year later when the Livonian order, um, again, as you mentioned on our, our stream number eight uh, on Nations of Charlemagne, um, began to attack the city of Skov, which is right on the um, the western perimeter of um, Russia, in um, 1241. And of course, Alexander Nevsky defeated them at the famous Battle of the Ice. And as someone in the chat, I think Judge Kalikid Bushman has mentioned, that is a film by, um, uh, what's what's his name? But anyway, um, it's, it's also a, um, a, 
Oh, the, the Soviet, the Soviet film from the thirties. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. It's also an overture by Prokofiev, but yes. And that, and that's where the sort of myth of the the knights falling into the ice comes from, which I don't think any any source from the time actually attests. Uh, we, one one thing I would add to that um, um, is one of the main reasons for the disagreements between the Swedes and the Republic of Novgorod is if if you look where Novgorod is situated, it's you know if if I'm if I'm not mistaken, it's the very northwest portion, you know, um, of the Rus on the sort of Baltic coastline. And so... Uh, um, Lake Pepius there, just um, with what's the border of Monday, Estonia. Uh, yes. Just, just so, north of Piskov, uh, if you so see they, on the map there. Yes, Pepe, I see. Uh, and so... And so they control, um, you know, the entrance to a lot of the major, the major rivers and thoroughways. And so, the, and so they, they, um, they can grow very wealthy with trade. And of course, um, this leads to all sorts of disagreements with the, with the Swedes and the Scandinavians who want to, who want to dominate this area for themselves. And so that's, that's um, sort of the fundamental reason for many of these conflicts. Although, of course, when you get to the, you know, you have the Eastern Crusades as well, which have um, left their legacy as well. There's a, there's a religious element to all of this too. You mentioned something which is very interesting, which is the the scarcity of um, actual sort of reliable accounts during this time. And a part of Alexander Nevsky is that he's essentially almost a semi-legendary figure because of this. I mean, if you look at even the the practicalities with the um, the original attack by Sweden, uh, the sources indicate that it was actually the Norwegians that were helping them. Well, of course, the Norwegians were actually at war with them <laughs> during the same time. And we yes. have later accounts of the um, the Norwegians being pitted against the Swedes, again, as part of um, Nevsky's foreign policy. So uh, they're relative. And again, the idea of hundreds of um, Livonian knights actually at the Battle of the Ice is again contested. You know, yes. and, 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 I mean, but it's very hard to tell, right? In many of these cases, we don't really know the numbers. In some of these battles, we don't even know the names of the generals, you know? Um, um, I think for one of the battles against the the Swedes, their, their their general apparently has a Greek name, which has confused a lot of people, a lot of historians. Hmm. And um, I, I think you know, obviously he's ruler of Novgorod. We mentioned the fact that Novgorod hadn't um, been sacked by the Mongols, and as a result, Novgorod has retained not only its maritime links across the Baltic, as you mentioned, Columba, but it's still a large city. It is effectively the most powerful city out of all the British principalities. And yes, going back to the, the, it has period, about. A hundred thousand people. That that's yeah, the that, best that, estimate. That, that's that's pretty generous. I say anywhere between like fifty and a hundred thousand. But but yes. Um. And, and again, it's important to note that as with Kiev, Novgorod is essentially the Rus capital in the north, as Kiev used to be, even though the local power of the princes had already moved to um, Vladimir Sustal. But again, that city had just been destroyed again by the Mongols. So this is. And, and, we say, you know, gets the interesting question about Alexander Nevsky is what to do, how to collaborate with your, you know, your conqueror, essentially. And in terms of his personal history, his uncle had been killed in battle. His father had been murdered by Ogodai's widow. Um, his brother had been made the the Grand Prince of Vladimir, and um, he was then later killed. Um, he was first, sorry, later forced into exile for um, resisting the Mongols. And so by 1251, um, he goes to um, to Sarai to meet um, Batu Khan, and he is made the Grand Prince of Vladimir, the supreme ruler of the Rus, as we mentioned, under the auspices of the Mongols, basically there to gather tribute for them. Now, what do the you know the Europeans do? The Europeans are just you know recovering after the devastating um, attack in 1240 and 1241, and they appeal to Alexander Nevsky to begin to wage war against the Russians, and. Um, he doesn't do so now. Why doesn't he do so? And why does he, um, you know, act successfully as their um their vassal essentially a vassal? Did you mean the Mongols from... there? Sorry, just so I don't get confused. Oh, sorry. What did I say? Russians. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, no, no. I, just, I, 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 I was getting confused. I thought I had misremembered something. No, no. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I sound like an old man. I can't remember what I said. Sort of um ten seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting there myself. Don't worry. <laughs> but um. <laughs> So, so yes, uh, so on the one hand, you have this um, checked part of this legacy, which is he is the defender of orthodox civilization against Catholic encroachment. And that is exemplified by the Swedish and that's exemplified by the Livonian order. However, he was willing to collaborate with Batu yes. Khan. That, that's now, one point I would like to bring up is that that that's kind of how he was um, how he was able to even to even accomplish this is, is he did have a lot of goodwill. Because, I mean, if you look at the Novgorod situation, um, you know the history throughout the the 1100s. It's just a litany of um, 
of um princes being invited in and then kicked out and then you have um um there's a sort of secondary ma uh, mag magistrate called a posadnik and <laughs> at times he operates as an independent authority sort of a tribune and so mm -hmm. there's all of this just absolute um um, um chaos it's a very a febrile situation in many ways it reminds you of athens you know ancient athens with exile and what have you but um it seems that um alexander nevsky's um, eponymous battle on the Neva um, allowed him to um, um, stay in power for for a very long time uh, in Novgorod. Relative, I mean, I mean, on its own, but relatively speaking, for the political history of Novgorod, it's a remarkably long um, period of control. Yes, and that that that's a, a very interesting point to note that his center of power is a nominal republic, and why the Mongols are useful to undermine any domestic opposition in this case. And of course, you know, what is the um, where when the Roman, when the Roman envoys, you know, are employing, uh, imploring that Alexander Nevsky um, attack the Russians, they're also imploring that he submit to the nominal authority of the Pope, um, which again is something he refuses to do. Because again, the idea that he needs to opt, in, if not again opting into Catholicism, but forswear any sort of independent authority. In this case, it would be the um, the Patriarch of Constantinople. You could say from a strictly orthodox point of view again it's an affront to his religion and you can say he is you know if that's his foremost concern he is defending the catholic faith yes. and therefore it must be noted that the mongols again they're demanding tribute but they're not demanding any sort of um religious conformity so whilst yes. at the same time and novgorod um, it's a very independently minded place i mean i think their motto at one point was um, um who can who can who can stand against god and novgorod there's an irony the great, in this isn't know? there there's an irony in the sense that um Alexander using his, you know, his collaboration with the Mongols, they, for example, begin to impose censuses and taxes and tribute statistics in Novgorod. And so Alexander dedicates a lot of his tenure rule as the supreme rule of the Rus, going around and compelling other cities within the vicinity of Novgorod and, of course, the Rus in general to pay tribute to the Mongols. So for the Mongols, Alexander... So they preserve their own independence at the cost of everybody else. <laughs> yes. So Alexander well, Nevsky is... Is, um, or rather they're all they're all submitting their independence they're, they're retaining some form of cultural religious independence and they're retaining their lives in return you might for say this, um, yeah you, you could say that the the novgorodians are essentially ensuring their place in the hierarchy as uh first among the subjects and that by being preeminent in their district they're basically willing to be the sort of errand boys of the mongols um there's, insofar there's the mongols don't uh, yeah, treat them with a heavy hand I'm going to push back against that slightly because I, I think I see this more as Alexander Nevsky personally occupying that position, using Novgorod as a basis of his independent power, oh, rather doubtless, than Novgorod, yes. rather than Novgorod occupying that position. I think it's very I, important to distinguish yeah. Novgorod from what would later become Muscovy. Yes, I, yeah, I do uh, think it's it, very important it, to note that um, I, Alexander wouldn't have been able to do um, what he did and hold on to power for so long um, without without the Mongol force behind him. Because, I mean, if you look at Novgorod, I'm, I'm pretty sure when, um, one of the names for the city, they actually called, the people of the city called the city itself Lord. They called the city Lord Novgorod the Great. Which, which and, and there's this um, fundamental idea that sovereignty is, is vested with the people, which it caused this, this febrile situation. And so, yeah, Alex, Alexander's um, political success in all likelihood, wouldn't have been possible without that force backing them up. I, yes, I will exactly. say I agree with you, Apostolic, on that um, pushback, actually. I, I should have probably used Alexander rather than Novgorod, but obviously he's using the power and position of Novgorod, Novgorod for his own ends, is what I yes. meant to say. And within his own experience, remember, the um, we, we mentioned the the, the Vecca Council, these, um, these local Republican institutions comprising of the local you know, artisans and merchants of the city, and the boyars, of course, who are going to you know, be a, a, a continuous um, irritation for the princes and later the czars. Both of these authorities had already ousted him from Novgorod, once so he's very aware of the um the febrile political situation within novgorod and so therefore appreciating the mongol armies as um you know cementing his authority and again it's important to know that at this time the rus are still even if they are completely devastated um their territory is still intact and Alexander Nevsky ensures that the territory is intact from the northern end with his campaigns against Livonia and against Sweden. And um, this is where we get to, um, you know, his, his greater legacy, because Novgorod becomes increasingly independent at this point, may, mainly pays lip service to the Mongols. Again, the fact um, of geographic distance from the center of Mongol power and Sarai is again a boon for them. But he leaves a dynastic legacy, which is important and we really shouldn't ignore, which is the fact that um, his brothers and his sons 
almost exclusively from this point now occupy the Grand Princedom of Vladimir. And um, again, the Mongols essentially are arbiters between these various princes and their constant wars over who is going to occupy the Grand Princedom, allowing them to affect some form of, you know, divide and rule. Ideally, they would have a strong ruler in the form of Alexander Nevsky, who can go around, have this heroic status, which prevents the fomenting of rebellion, yet at the same time allows him to extract resources painlessly from the Russian people and just hand them over to the Russians. But of course, the idea of a civil war within the Rus is also beneficial for the Mongols. However, it means that they're actually extracting less resources at the same time and having to invest more resources into Russia in terms of arbitrating the situation. The last um, direct prince, you know, um, uh, in, in terms of like an independent prince of Moscow um, from the Nevsky line is Andre III, who dies in um uh, in 1304 and um again like his father he's also famous for repelling another swedish invasion at the river neva and um his and could you argue have... could you argue that the sort of history because i mean i mean one thing that i learned is that you know in many cases before you get um alexander in these dynastic ambitions um in in novgorod um the princes and even the archbishops were were selected um, um, with the sanction of of Kiev, and so do you think that legacy of domination from Kiev um, 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 softened the, the the domination by the Mongols, perhaps? Well, the issue with, again, Kiev occupies a spiritual significance. I mean, even if you're talking about the the Metropolitan, the Rus, who is the um, the principal religious figure, again, subordinate to the Patriarch nominally in Constantinople, he is still the metropolitan of Kiev, but he now resides in Vladimir. All of the um, political oh, power of course, yes. in, in 1169 had moved to Vladimir Suzdal, and Kiev itself had basically been destroyed. So when you see the use of Kiev in the title, it is paying lip service to the original capital of the of Lucia, of the Rus state of Ruthenia. But in reality, all political power emanating from Kiev has declined. And we are going to explain that in, you can say, excruciating um, lengths as we get on to the, um, the Lithuanian conquest. And this, I think, is a good time to uh, contrast the case of Alexander Nevsky with his southern counterpart in the form of um, Daniel of Haliech. Because unlike Alexander Nevsky, um, Haliech does everything possible, save, you know, um, losing his own life of resisting the Mongols. Um, just to put this in perspective, uh, Galicia Volunesia or Galicia Lodomeria had established itself from the end of the 13th century, sorry, the end of the 12th century, as one of the most um, powerful of the princes, even eclipsing that of Kiev, because again, Vladimir Suzdal and Haliech, could say with the um the two principal sources of power other than um, Novgorod in the north. Um with the power base in Haliac, Daniel, who was the um the, the prince of Haliac at the time of the Mongol conquest, um resists submitting to Mongol authority, even though the Mongols are passing directly through his territories to attack Hungary and to attack Poland until 1246, you know, three years after the um the original summons. Um, however, he, this again, this isn't enough for him. He's always finding ways of trying to undermine the Mongol authority and establish himself as an independent Rus ruler. And he does this by taking up the offer of the Roman, um, the Roman legate, which Alexander Nevsky had ignored, which is he accepts the title of King of Russia or um, Rex Lucia in Latin. Um, and in 1253, he is actually crowned by a papal legate on the authority of the Pope and awarded with this title in order that, again, he leads the Rus in some sort of grand rebellion. And this is the exact same time that um, Alexander Nevsky is the Grand Prince of Vladimir, who is the nominal leader of the Rus. But of course, in contrast to Alexander and Nevsky, is this and is this sort of off of the back of the you know of course with the with the Latin Empire and and, and the vast the vastly increased influence that that the Catholic West has in the East they, they they can do this yes there is no alternative authority in Byzantium at this point I mean the Paleologus dynasty hasn't even begun the reconquest of um, Constantinople so yes you're completely correct the the Pope is effectively to be interfering in the domestic affairs of um, orthodox principalities to enact some form of nominal um, concession to papal authority without actually having to convert. And that exactly. is the case. So, sorry, go pass so, so, Sorry. Sorry, and, and that is the case with um with Daniel. But you know, with Daniel, it, it isn't successful. Um, in twelve five nine under um Berke Khan, there is another attack through Poland, and of course they go through Lod 
them area and Daniel is forced to destroy all of his fortresses which he constructed again to try and resist the um the occupation if anything it's incredible that um his kingdom wasn't destroyed by Berka and that he was allowed to retain it and leave it to his son Lev and Lev in contrast to his father begins like Alexander Nevsky almost realizing the futility of resistance actively collaborating with the Mongols and at the expense of his Catholic neighbors. I mean, the kingdom of uh, Galicia, Lodomeria, or Volunesia would even collaborate you know, extensively with the Mongols when it came to the invasions of um, 1285 and 1287. Nevertheless, his dynasty would die out. And when um, his dynasty died out, they would be basically partitioned by Poland and Lithuania. And this again marks you can say the complete conquest of the Rus from all sides, because we've talked about the Mongol conquest, but as we get to the end of the stream, we're going to be talking about the um, the Lithuanian and the Polish conquest of the vast Rus domains in the in the West. It's worth mentioning just to buttress your point there, Apostolic, that um, in in this sort of in this time that the East Empire is still essentially in absentia, uh, based in Nicaea. Um, obviously, they hadn't reconquered Constantinople. Uh, ergo, ergo, the power of the Patriarch um, is not in Constantinople at present. And also, leading up just for a bit more context as, as to why the, the Pope is putting out these feelers, so to speak, eastwards, is that because, I suppose, uh, carrying onto the, onto the back of, of the success of a, the initial crusades in the Levant, and then obviously with the crusades of the uh, Livonian order in the north, uh, despite the defeat at um, Lake Pepius at the hands of Alexander Nevsky, um, that the Pope also leading up to the sack of Constantinople and the Fourth Crusade had uh, sent overtures to Serbia and to Bulgaria and had limited success in actually um, uh, bringing over some of the Orthodox princes in the Balkans to the Roman Catholic Rite. And so obviously they- but Do you uh, think it's sort of a, a Charlemagne effect, we might say that's what the Pope is hoping for here? That by yeah, investing him with the power, you know, yeah, yeah um, the, the ultimate uh, sovereignty lies with the Pope. Yeah, and 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 utilizing a spiritual power to undertake a, you might say, something more of a more cynical kind of um, uh, geopolitical. Um, that when I say geopolitical, I don't want to use that word because I don't want to bastardize it in a modern context. But you know, the Pope extending its its temporal power by means of spirituality, if you know what I mean. Well, the, the interesting thing about this is that this isn't this is ultimately successful. It's not successful with the example of Daniel of Halyage, but throughout the because of course all of these territories would be annexed by the um, the crowns of Lithuania and Poland throughout the you know next um, centuries up until the 18th century, and the effect of all of these Orthodox populations is that they essentially become Catholics of the Greek rite, whereby they use the um, the old, uh, they use the old, Greek, you know, Greek liturgy. They are basically orthodox, but they accept the Pope as their nominal religious head. So, so would this be somewhat yeah. similar to the situation in the south of Italy? Mm. Uh, probably, the probably more rite, true. The Greek rite. Probably, be, probably. Well, the thing is with the the, the, the southern Italians, is they more or less are, are brought over to the Catholic Church uh, in, in yes, but there's a, there's a sort of in between period, isn't there, where where they pay due diligence they, to the Pope, but they, also still follow yeah. some of the Greek rite. Yeah, there there is. Uh, or, yeah, I suppose in that context, yes, you're right. But the 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 Greek Catholic phenomena really uh, survives to one day in places such as um Ukraine, in yes. uh, Ruthenia. In, the difference um, is, in, Columba, is that um as Marcus is saying, we're talking basically all of um Western Ukraine and parts of Belarus. Yeah. This um phenomena lasts. You know, it begins with Daniel of Halyech. It's confirmed after the um the union of Lublin and fifty. 1969 and this is a situation which lasts 500 years and still exists to this day where you have um Precisely. catholics of the greek right rather than a temporary measure to facilitate the ultimate you could say elimination of the greek right in italy but again before that becomes um too tangential we get to the um the principal protagonist of the story which is um, uh, the rise it, of the state of moscow if i can bookend that just briefly apostolic um sure also the, the the fate of byzantium um has a profound effect of this as well that with the erosion of the of the patriarchal constantinople without having being able to work in hand in hand with the emperor because obviously the emperor is killed uh constantine the level dies in the, in the siege um and i suppose we'll get to that another point um and the turks take over the city and uh, yeah. absorb uh, and so russia the becomes Pantheon. the main so, the main torchbearer so, of this culture yeah well well the russians become this main torchbearer but also for those greeks that had uh, the greeks sorry these russians these easterners who have taken on their loyalty to the pope but still practicing a greek rite 
reinforces their decision because the Pope is still an independent actor at this point. It hasn't been conquered by Islam, so to speak. Indeed, I see. So moving on to the, the beginnings of Moscow, as, as we mentioned, I think Moscow, it, the story of Moscow is incredible because it's the, the most unlikely city to carry on the reunification of Russia, but not only that, lead Russia to becoming one of the you know greatest powers of all time. Yes. Because, because Mos- even relatively speaking amongst the, the Rus states, um, Moscow was very insignificant, right? It was nothing. Um, when, when, when Kiev was at you know the height of its power, it was really negligible to the point where in some of the it chronicles, you know, it yes, yes, it's not, it's barely time, mentioned. Yeah. It's passed over totally. The first time it was mentioned was um in any chronicle was in 1147 but even then we're talking about the old town and this isn't a city this is a town this is basically just a wooden fort on the Moscow river um this area was destroyed um with the you know original mongol conquest and basically had been you know of virtually no value whatsoever but why does it enter prominence well we talked about the progeny and the legacy of alexander nevsky how members of his family were able to carry on and serve the position of grand prince of vladimir well it, as with the case with so many of the Rus princes, they offered concessions, principalities, apanishes, whatever you say, to the younger son. And the younger son of Alexander Nevsky was Daniel, um, uh, Daniel Rurikovich. And Daniel was offered the most pathetic of all these concessions, which was this tiny timber fort in the middle of nowhere called Moscow. And from this tiny little possession which now had um a, a local prince ruling it again which was just nominally you know completely under the control of the um the local power of vladimir suzdal um daniel was able to make it into a center a new local power center the center of a new principality as its first prince and he did this by essentially his um friend and his brother dimitri becomes um grand prince of vladimir and as part of this alliance with you know vladimir suzdal um the city emerges from the original timber fort to become a city you know monasteries yes. are founded there the, the, this is um, something Daniel that himself... um, i was just going to say that in the introduction to um a translation of the novgorod chronicle that i was looking at um um i can't remember his name now um but but the guy who wrote the introduction he makes this exact point that it, it does really seem that without um the impact of the mongol of the mongol yoke and, and the invasions and and the the resulting fallout um, um, the Russian state and the, and the later Russian Empire, as we have known it, um, it, it might have panned out completely differently. Well, it's impossible to say that Moscow of all places, again, it, it's, the fact, it's helped by the fact that virtually all of Moscow's rivals have been destroyed in some form or another. So when we talk about, you know, why did Moscow grow so rapidly? Well, because it was in a relatively safe location away from most of the of the Mongol raids or indeed the, the northern attacks or the Lithuanian attacks, so, so to speak. Um, we have hundreds, we have tens of thousands of refugees from all of the devastated, depopulated parts of the Kievan Rus flocking to the relative safety of Moscow. And the irony is that Moscow in its very early history, so we're talking the um, the 13th century, instantly had two major rivals in the city of Ryazan and the city of um, Tivar. Uh, Ryazan, of course, had been raised to the ground and rebuilt again. However, the irony was that um, Tivar and Ryazan both basically surrounded Moscow, and yet they also acted as buffers, buttresses against potential invasion because if the mongols were to lead any raid up north they would attack ryzan and ignore moscow say for example so the city was safe and using this some um, safe secluded location eventually um under uh, uh dmitry donstoy they would construct the um the moscow kremlin um you have a, a i think that of- also goes some way am towards explaining the relatively rapid rise in population that you see in moscow because i yes, mean exactly. i mean in any um, difficult time you know a place of safety is going to be you know people are going to flock to it um you know what i mean it's, it's also, also one... worth mentioning oh sorry go apostolic i'll go after you no you, you make your point first oh, okay i was just going to say moscow has a couple of advantages because we mentioned the previous stream how the kiev and rus had this propensity to build on either waterways and mostly on flat ground and um and in, in wide open spaces um which is to their detriment when the mongols arrive but um moscow is yet another city built on seven hills and for those who are aware aren't aware of the pattern rome is built on seven hills constantinople is built on seven hills and moscow is built on seven hills um hence hence why the analogy of the third rome has a bit <laughs> it's a winning it. formula it would seem it is a winning formula and and also too moscow is uh 
uh, I can't actually see on that map. Uh, so I, I, I can't, I don't think, Moscow's not on that map, is it? No. But Moscow actually, I believe, um, is is close to two river systems. You have the Oka River, which sort of makes its way to Moscow. And then there's another river, which the name just escapes me. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember. But it's, it's, it, it has close proximity to two river systems, which isn't similar to the uh, Sarai um, issue, uh, the Sarai example, where it's cl it sits in between the Don and the Volga. It's, it, you know, it's, it's a, of great strategic value. Um, uh, and uh, and and so, because all these other cities had been devastated, and although Moscow was this tiny town that was raised by the Mongols, it has so many advantages to it. And so that with the the uh, the historical destru destruction of much of the countryside, Moscow becomes an attractive place. And so, sort of by inherent value, Moscow becomes um, sort of it. Ha you might say it has the fundamental comp components of making a good place for settlement to arise, and that's exactly what happens. Mm. I suppose there also wasn't much to steal, relatively speaking. <laughs> exactly. But more than just the location and the actual physical city, which is, you know, rapidly expands due to the influx of refugees from the general devastation of the conquest, um, the dynasty established by Daniel, who is the precursor of all the later Muscovite, you know, Rurikovid rulers all the way up until Fyodor I, begin a attempt at a process of primogeniture. What has been so devastating to all of these other Rus principalities is the rota system. It's the idea that not only do you have to accept some form of um, collateral succession, but you need to divide up your provinces to allow for this form of collateral succession by which you ascend to your main province. And of course, it started off as Kiev, but then you descend further and further and further. And even as Moscow is um, aggrandizing, um, many of the surrounding principalities still adopt this form of succession, which involves the total passing out this of its territory. fratricidal mania. Yeah. And so what and what so and what you see with Moscow is that after every generation, the city gains substantial bits of land. And of course Ivan the First um, is known as the um the gatherer of lands. And you see this continuously you know, all the way through Russian rulers is that every Russian ruler with fuck with a couple of exceptions gains these massive uh, massive swathes of land. You know essentially every um Every rule en encompasses, you know, the massive expanse of the of the, the, the royal domains of Moscow. If you were to basically, you know, make it an equivalent of Paris and our Paris stream, we're seeing the um, development of a new royal center of power. And this immediately, you know, within one generation, Moscow has gone from an irrelevance beginning with Daniel, and at the death of Daniel, with the death of um his um his cousin Andre the third, we have Moscow as one of the principal centers of power, vying over for the title of the Grand Prince of Vladimir. The other cities, as I mentioned, were um, Tver and of um, Ryazan. From 1304 until 1325, there is this um, brutal war between um, Tver and um, Ryazan. And I'll just show on this, um, this next slide, which is here. Um, the Prince of Tver, Dmitri, summons um, Yuri of Moscow to Osbek Khan um, in order basically to have him, you know, um, put on trial for supposed um, acts of treachery against the Mongol prince. And rather than allowing the trial to take place, Dmitri simply murders him in front of the Khan. Um, again, just exa examining the, um, the scale Charming. of, the, um, the, scale of the, um, the hostility between these princes. Nevertheless, the, um, the conflict between um, Tver and, um, and Moscow, you know, goes on for the next century. But Moscow very quickly is able to um, eclipse Tver, beginning with the rise of um, Yuri's son, um, Ivar, uh, sorry, Ivan, the new, new Grand Prince of Vladimir. Uh, originally, again, this title, like with so many of the titles post Alexander Nevsky, is contested. But in um, 1328, I believe, um, Uzbek confirms Ivan as the uncontested Grand Prince, and in that position, the principal tribute collector or tax farmer for the Mongols, as had been the case with his grandfather, um, Alexander Nevsky. And um, he was so useful. And again, this is why I talk about Moscow as rising in power with the dynasty as opposed to, you know, Alexander Nevsky and Novgorod. Ivan I, as the ruler of Moscow, was so useful to the Mongols as a tax collector that he actually earned the epithet um, Ivan Kalita, which means money bags in Russia. Russian. And so, you know, essentially he was you know, collecting vast resources, but also expanding his I've own... I've also um, heard it translated as Ivan of the coin purse. Yes, exactly. Uh, and again, that's just, that's basically the same meaning. And, um, but, but again, kind of like, um, 
like a Henry the Seventh figure in England, um, he purposely uses um, fiscal policy not only as a means to satiate his um, Mongol rulers and therefore allow the Mongols to invest more and more power into him, but um, it means that the Mongols are not, you know, raiding anywhere near Moscow. Moscow is becoming um, a tranquil place within the within the Tatar yoke. It is becoming a center of law. He's using his resources to attack bandits. He's making Moscow the center of um, Russian trade within yes. the region. And, and we've um, already we've... spoken about how comfortably the Muscovites were were adapting to the Mongol yoke in terms of the um, even even the intermarriage and the taking on of Mongol names, which which interestingly enough, later on, once um, once the Mongols are gone, many of these names that are Mongol names will then have like a, a, a vich or, a, or an of and added to the end as a sort of um, russification of a Mongol name that Russians had taken on originally. <laughs> Gulovich. <laughs> <laughs> Gulovich, that's great. <laughs> and um, with Ivan, I mean, again, this, as I said, it doesn't just extend to the Mos uh, to the um, to the Mongols. One of his, you know, more interesting strategies is that he's so rich that when the Mongols go on these slave raids, continuous slave raids into Russian territory, um, he actually pays the Mongols to acquire the slaves, lets them free, and lets them settle in Moscow, and again become part of the ever, you know, expanding um, scope of the city and work in the city essentially. But more than that, because all these cities are being raided, and because you have all this constant um, interdynastic strife brought around by constant succession wars all of these cities surrounding moscow are becoming incredibly poor and so um ivan the first kalita establishes himself as the principal money lender for the region as well and through this process he basically <laughs> the creates grand some... high user <laughs> <laughs> the grand high user i think is a fair term um so basically he traps all of these um statelets surrounding moscow into debt and in return for you know allowing the the ruler essentially to get off um, to get off with his debts um he acquires the territory so you see this massive expansion the annexation of muscovite territory and combine that with and again we're talking about you know specific territories such as um, Uruk and Galich. And by the death of Ivan I, combined with the um, practice of primogeniture, his son, Simeon, and then his brother, um, Ivan II, are both, you know, acknowledged as the Grand Prince of Vladimir without any contest by Uzbek. You know, the fact, again, it's become so ingrained that the ruler of Moscow is therefore the natural supreme prince of all the Rus, when only, you know, two, two generations before, it had been nothing but a fort. Yes, it's a remarkable meteoric ascent, isn't it? Hmm. And I think this is interesting uh, in contrast, you know, what's happening with um, with Novgorod. Uh, well, actually, there's one last point I want to make. This is also the time Ivan is supposed to have um, received the um, Monomach cap or the Golden Cap, that iconic um, fur cap, which um, you later see, you know, used by the Tsars all the way down until um, Peter the Great transforms the design of Russian heraldry. That, again, dates from this time. Again, talk about the conferring status that you bestow this um, this imperial regal cap upon the um, the Grand Prince of Vladimir to basically solidify his rule as your, you know, your, your, your principal under vassal, which, of course, is what um, uh, Ivan Kalita was to, to Ozbek. But What's happening to, um, also, sorry, one last point to mention. I mentioned, you, sorry, you mentioned the symbolic significance of Kiev, and I mentioned the fact that the metropolitan of Kiev had actually moved to Vladimir. Well, the city of Vladimir has now become completely eclipsed by Moscow. Yes, and then um, he moves to Moscow, yes. <laughs> because of its um, because of its wealth and power, again, uh, all of these things are moving to Moscow. And the metropolitan who is based in Kiev, uh, who is based in um, Vladimir, now also moves to Moscow. And in gratitude, again, because Moscow is such a young city with very little in, in terms of like a grand um, dynastic heritage. Um, the metropolitan who moves to um, to Moscow first, uh, Metropolitan Peter, is made Saint Peter, the patron saint of the city of Moscow thereafter. So all of mm. these elements are consciously, again, trying to associate the idea of Moscow as the center of the Rus, moving away from all of these previous capitals. And, um, and Novgorod is becoming increasingly dependent on Moscow and Tver, because, I mean, I mean I'm pretty sure... Um, um, Novgorod was having real trouble feeding the population. Perhaps it was a labor shortage from all of the, mm. the you know, the insane troubles that the um, the Rus had went through. But they were becoming increasingly dependent on um on um trade and interchange and workers from Moscow and Tver particularly. Well, they're also in an impossible situation as far as foreign policy is concerned because they're surrounded on all sides by potentially more again more militarily powerful powers. They're an effective trade power, but um, again, due to the fact that the city is basically being controlled by you know 
uh, merchants, the um, the actual sort of military authority, you know, power of Novgorod is waning, and all they can do is simply sometimes intervene to either support Muscovy or support Tver in their, you know, constant um, constant civil war with each other. But of course, at the same time, as we'll talk about in a couple of minutes, we have the growing power of Lithuania at the same time, adding a new power, which is again a potential um, threat to Novgorod. So Novgorod is standing back, retaining its, you know, semi-independence from the Mongols because of, again, the proximity but having to balance all of these um, potential threats to its autonomy. And this is where we get to um, the last sort of hurrah of the um, the, the Mongol Empire. So what was happening with the um, the Golden Horde at this time? You mentioned Columba about the Yam system and the, the postal network system. Well, because of the Mongol conquest establishing rule over you know all of Eurasia, especially during the the reign of of Tokta, you know at the turn of the um, the turn of the 14th century. Um, what we see is this massive expansion of trade, which and also diffusion of information that was, you know, not not seen before. And again, this this massive yes. cultural exchange because fact, because it, it's the, their their empire, unlike say the Han or the Roman, it's directly along you know the Silk Road, all of these mm -hmm. massive arteries of trade. And so yes, there's a huge there's a huge interchange. Yes, and you mentioned the fact, um, Marcus, that um, the Ilkhanate, of course, have been the first to um, convert to Islam. Well, mm -hmm. under um, Tokta's successor, Osbeg Khan um, becomes the first Muslim to um, to rule over the Golden Horde. And of course, the fact that um, the, the main religion of the Golden Horde had been Tengriistic. I mean, the the idea of the religion of the Horde was always something in flux. I mean, there was even this possibility among you know many Roman Catholics that Tokta would actually convert to Christianity. Of course, he never. Oh, did. that he would have been so big. He remained a um, <laughs> he remained a um, lifelong pagan, and for the first um, seven years of the rule of um, Uzbek Khan, um, he was basically fighting Buddhists. He was fighting um, uh, he was fighting shamans until they were all you know murdered or, 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 or defeated. But you know he had established by at least 1320 um, the Golden Horde as you know a strong Muslim power, and of course the Muslim influence in um, in the steppe had been, you know, ongoing ever since the um, the Abbasid Caliphate. So there had been Muslims in this region for 500 years, and it, I think it very much is a case of the the local dominant religion assimilating its rulers, as was the case yeah. with virtually all of the um, the, the, the Mongol nations or orders. I mean, we talked about the Khazars last time and how influenced they were by Islam as well. You know, despite again the, having a elite Jewish contingent. But in terms of yes. like, how does this change the the nature of rule? Well. As with um, you know the pagan the pagan rule over um, the empire, they were basically content to allow the Christians you know be. From our sources, Osbeck seems to have you know again treated the Christians well, but again we have the you could say the transfer of the old tribute, and now we have the formal imposition of the jizya on the on the Christian populations. But really, because the Mongols are already extracting as much tribute as was humanly possible during this time, it was simply a matter of changing the name of it and changing the certain institutions and you know religious institutions that were associated with it but never you might call Osbeg, it a process of religious formalization um yes, of the institution exactly. that already existed yeah yes exactly um and i think it's important to note that um the golden horde is still you know one of the most militarily powerful states at this time and osbeg and his son janibek in particular are always at war you know with the, the two prominent neighbors the chagatai khanate and the il khanate attempting to unify the remnants of the mongol empire especially in the west but at the same time, they're always forced eventually to recognize the supremacy of the Yuan Empire, as we mentioned, the state formed by Kublai Khan, which has you know, infinitely more manpower than any of these um, these other Western states. But, yes, I mean, uh, they're in control of China, which which even at this point had an absurdly large population. And they will continue to rule China until uh, um, the Ming Dynasty takes over in the 1360s. So this is, again, the, the Yuan Dynasty isn't simply a one reign, one with um, Kublai Khan, um, it does endure, even though in a diminished form for, you know, nearly, you know, 100 years since um, its foundation, I believe it was in 1271. But nevertheless, you know, what happens to Saray? You mentioned the fact that um, it's at this strategic strategic location, the near confluence of the Don and the, um, the Volga rivers. Well, now it has a mosque, now it has palaces, now it has bathhouses, now it has um, institutional buildings. You know, this is all part of the you know cultural diffusion brought around by the conscious you know patronage of um islam as opposed to islam simply existing in the background and you know the consequence of osbeck's um osbeck's conversion and you can say the 
transition of the Golden Horde from a nomadic empire into an increasingly sedentary empire as they begin to occupy this territory for a long period of time. And therefore, Sarai, or New Sarai, as it becomes, you know, known, becomes the central trade of, trade of, you know, all the Volga. You know, it, it intersects with China, it intersects with the Genoese and the Venice, uh, Venetian merchants in the Black Sea. And of course, it's a central slave hub as well you know the most of the slaves in europe pass through new sarai in order to get to the principal slave market which of course is the uh, yes. Mamluk i mean that that, that whole area is just thick with slaves i mean mm. i mean i mean in the in the in the crimea some of the descriptions of the of the of the the, the treatment of slaves and I, I mean there was a there was a chronicle from i think a lithuanian monk and he says that the slaves were you know worked wearing chains all day and then at night they were they were thrown into cells and they were fed um, um food that not even a dog would look at that those are his actual words so it's it, it's um very Oof, cool that's, uh, yeah i know that's harsh <laughs> Sorry, do you want me to um <laughs> yeah sorry sorry <laughs> on, that lovely, no, on, on, on that lovely image of course um something we haven't mentioned is um well obviously you know osbeck um dies in 1341 i believe and um he's replaced by um Tinebeg, who is then um, was instantly murdered by his brother janibek and janibek is most famous for being instrumental in bringing the um black death from Yuan Dynasty China into Europe by first using it as a form of um, biological warfare, essentially, against the um, the Genoese colonies in the Crimea, who then, of course, transported to the rest of Europe. And of course, you know, who are among the um, the casualties, the Black Death, it is, of course, the Grand Prince of um, Muscovy, uh, Simeon, of course, dies. And um, I think it's also important that there's a, there's an interesting story involving the um, the Metropolitan Alexis, whereby Janibeg was very concerned about the growing power of Moscow. And of course, with the death of um, Ivan I, uh, we have the somewhat weaker rulers in the form of Simeon, and then later with um, Ivan II. And apparently Moscow was spared a punitive expedition by Janibeg because the Metropolitan Alexis was able to um, effect a miracle by curing the blindness of um, Janibeg's mother, um, Tydula. Interesting sort of element of history because me the Metropolitan Alexis would then be instrumental in the tutelage of um, Daniel um, Donetskoy, who would then again lead the first major Muscovite resistance against the um, the Mongols, just to sort of mm -hmm. wrap this up into some sort of interesting narrative. But just um, a piece of light, light providence for the audience. <laughs> and this comes to you know that again, the, these are the sort of the last sort of effective rulers of the of the of the continuation of the the independence of the Khan. And here we get to the um, the disintegration. Of the horde, albeit with um, one noticeable exception in the form of Toktamesh, and this is where we get to talk about um, Tamerlane. So, Janibeg was murdered in 1157, and his son, you know, uh, Berdibeg, who had murdered his father, you know, a patricidal successor, was in turn murdered by his brother Kolpa. You mentioned Columba, how the Mongols had so ingrained themselves in. Christian civilization in Christian civilization that they began affecting um, Mongol names. Well, the cultural interchange was both ways. So Kolka actually had two Christian sons and was rumored to be a Christian himself. And I, I can't forget the names now, but Kolka had actually overseen his son's conversion to Russian Christian names. I think one was called Ivan, for example. And the effect of this was so um, devastating to the Mongols, the idea that they had um, a, Christ a Christian Russified um, Khan, that he was quickly deposed that led to a period known as the, um, the Time of Trouble. This isn't the, you know, the same Time of Troubles we see of Russia, it's just the, um, the Golden Khan um, Time of Troubles. And um, um, sorry, sorry, something on my mind. And um, during this um, period, we have the rise of uh, Timur of the of the Balas clan. I, I'm sure you know most of you have um, heard of uh, Tamerlane. Well, Tamerlane started off as you could say a um, a minor non-entity essentially. Um, he was a vassal of the of the Chagatai Khans, and he. Um, uh, from that position of power, he had basically you know, taken over Transoxania by 1370. He had taken the city of Bach and he had married um, Sarai Mulk Khanum, uh, granting him the title of Gokhani, which means the son-in-law 
of Genghis Khan, or in this case, the Genghishids. And this was an attempt of uh, Amir Tumo to legitimize his conquest within you know, Central Asia. And his mission, now that the Ilkhanate basically collapsed, was to restore the, um, the Ilkhanate Empire through a process of you know, 35 years of continuous campaigns from um, 1317 until um, uh, 1405. And after you know, his, he's defeated the Ottomans, he's defeated the Delhi Sultanate, he's defeated the Mamluks, he will defeat the Golden Horde. He is left ruler of everything from um, Anatolia to Delhi, essentially, and everything from you know, Kazakhstan to Iran at the same time. And, you know, um, ruling over the Caucasus at the same time. So what we're talking about is, and again, a man who uses the um, Mongol, st Mongol um, style of terror at the same time. We're talking potentially eliminating 400,000 people in his campaigns. We're talking about mountains of skulls outside of these cities, again, waging this conscientious psychological warfare. Um, I would almost go so far to say that Timur actually exceeds his predecessors in absolute cruelty. Uh, in that regard, like he actually steps it up another level in ma in many many ways. He's he's almost um. If there was to be a de definition of pitiless, it would be Tamale. Yes, and I think that's that's fair. I think what's important to notice is that Tamerlane wasn't able to achieve the same scale of the conquests of um Genghis Khan and his successors. We're talking about a localized region around the proximity of the Ilkhanate, you know, moving into Anatolia and moving into India. But um, within that territory, you could say, as a percentage, he eradicated more people than than the um, the original conquest of um, Genghis and, of course, Monka and um, Ogadai Khan. I suppose and, he didn't I, I have think... the momentum of Genghis, and so if he's wanting to inaugurate his own um, Genghis-like. Um, tear across Central Asia, then he's going to have to ramp up the cruelty. I think I think it's worth mentioning that he probably succeeds of once you have the the break the break apart of of, of the original Mongol Empire, where you sort of, where you have the the Changatai and the Ilkhanate and the Golden Horde. I think Tim, Tamerlane is responsible for the greatest consolidation from that period. He's probably considering his modest background. You got to think he's not a Genghisid. He's a very, very minor player as as a young man. And by the time he dies as a seventy year old, he's probably achieved. It's fair to say he's achieved the greatest consolidation. And just as a as a as a um an example for the chat, um, he actually becomes the. I can't remember because uh, I think it was Hugalu who 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 captured. Baghdad the first time, if I'm not mistaken, when they killed yeah, the Abbasid yeah, yeah. Caliphate. He becomes the second person after after, after Hugalu to, to capture and almost destroy Baghdad. And Baghdad had actually achieved something of a recovery from this point onwards. And um, and um, when the city is captured, despite there being quite a fierce resistance by the local Arabs, the city is captured and he instructs his army, and I believe the army that Tamerlane commands at Baghdad is about 50 or 60,000 strong, he, has, he gives an explicit order where he says, for each of my soldiers, you must bring me the heads of two uh, citizens of this city, and I'm going to build skulls with them. And they build 120 skulls of uh, 120 pyramids of like, I don't know, 2,000 skulls each or something. Like it, it's 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 huge. The 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 absolute pitiless brutality of this man. Yes, absolutely. And um, but how does he you know relate to the story? Um, well, he's responsible. For for, you can say, briefly rectifying the situation in the Golden Horde for the detriment of all involved, including the Russians. Um, as we mentioned, the Jokid dynasty in the Golden Horde, the successors of Batu Khan, have been infighting since the death of um, Janibek. And this is an opportunity for, um, for Timur because he's wanting to gain a new client state, which could basically guarantee his northern frontier. Because if we look at this geographically, we're talking about the northern um, coast of the Caspian Sea, you know, directly um, corresponding to the northern borders of his territories in Transoxania, whilst he can basically campaign unimpugned into Iran and, you know, restore the Ilkhanate. And in this case, he picks um, a, a jockey prince known as Toktamesh. Toktamesh had been dispossessed of, um, you know, his, his homeland in the 1370s and had returned to the um, the court of uh, Timur in Samarkand, uh, basically looking for aid. And using Toktamesh potentially as that client, uh, Timur helps again to restore him to the um, the throne of the Golden 
Board by the late 1370s. And with um, Timur's backing, Toktamesh is able to successfully reunite the Horde and become an effective um, Khan, the first effective Khan since um, Janabek. And one of his first um, acts is to forcefully reimpose authority over the Rus. Um, we'll, we'll talk about you know what the Rus have been up to uh, slightly later on, but from 1380 to 1382, he wages war against the Rus, sacks the city, and forces um, the Grand Prince uh, Daniel Donskoy into a formal submission again, again clarifying their relationship with them that Moscow will not become an independent state. And even the Lithuanians who have been expanding rapidly into Ruthenia at this time, which again we'll, we'll talk about, um, acknowledged the power of Toptomesh and um, paid him tribute. And with this, you can say, exceptional growth of power, the fact he's able to unite the Golden Horde so quickly and then effect you know, a complete turnaround in the fortunes of the Golden Horde and restore it to the vilified you know, notoriety which it had you know, um, been since 1240, 1241, um, he uses this an opportunity to betray his erstwhile benefactor, Tamerlane. And reviving the ambitions of Osbek and Yanabek, he attacks the Caucasus, he attacks Iran, and he attacks Central Asia. And from the beginning, he's successful. He begins this in um, 1387. These are the so-called uh, Toptomesh Timur Wars. And he continues to advance into Tabriz and into Azerbaijan until he's finally defeated by uh, Timur at the Battle of the uh, Kondacha River in 1391. And after that, Timur appoints more loyal um, vassals to um, to rule at least the eastern part of the, um, the Horde in his stead. It should be noted that the Horde, at least nominally, had two divisions, the Blue Horde in the west and the White Horde in the east, even though some chronicles you know, um, skip that up, of course, the Blue Horde being the principal horde with the um, the capital of New Sarai. However, just, a even... brief, just a brief side note, AM, just that battle you mentioned too with uh, Tokamesh, it's actually the closest the Tamerlane actually comes to being defeated on the battlefield. It's a very, very close run thing, um, just for the chat. So I... Tamerlane <laughs> was never defeated? Um, to my knowledge, no. I could be mistaken, but I'm pretty sure he wasn't. Um, very impressive. But, but, but at, at the very least, whilst he's Khan of the Ulkhanate, he, um that battle against uh, his first battle against Tokamesh is actually the closest run. is is very, very um, down to the wire, and only through absolute skill and great tactical leadership. Because Tim Tim is actually a very good tactician. Um, he sort of wins that battle by the skin of his teeth, um, and he really much proves his credentials from that battle onwards. Sorry, continue. There's, so yeah. there's one element. Um, with you mentioned Timur's lowly status, um, he could only actually rise to the rank of Amir, which means or Amir, which means um, commander uh, di directly in um, Arabic. He couldn't assume the title of Khan. He couldn't assume even the title of um, yes, Sultan. Um, yes. All of these, um, he could only ever act nominally under the authority of his um, Chagatai patrons, even mm. though he had completely um, sidelined them, even though yes. this wouldn't be too much of a concern for all of his successors who would use the term Gukane and later, you know, uh, Badishar or Padishar to basically mean, you know, emperor in all but name. But at least when, you know, Timur was concerned, he could only affect sort of military power in the form of mm. the position of Amir rather than Indeed. assuming sovereign power. That, I've always that, wondered that, where the term Padishah, I've always wondered where that term came from. Now I understand. So I can, it's enhanced my Dune knowledge, guys. <laughs> uh, that, that that did motivate him, though, to marry one of the princesses of the Genghisids, though, one of the descendants. Um, so that he could, could claim essentially the yes, title is, son of the this Khan. Is, this, this is the title uh, Gukane, which means yes. uh, son-in-law of Genghis, essentially. Mm -hmm. And if you if you look at the legacy of this title, for anyone who, for, for some reason, is interested in the uh, progeny of Timur, um, this Gukane, this this um, appellation, goes all the way down through the Mughal dynasty, and it's used all the way up until um, 1858 with the deposition of the last um, Mughal emperor in Delhi during the. Um, during the Indian mutiny against Britain, just in terms of the um, the longevity of this title, it has a 500 year history. So um, just just to point that out, but um, as I mentioned with um, uh, Toktamesh, um, Toktamesh is defeated by Timur, and he then comes back. And this is an interesting fact about Toktamesh is that he repeatedly comes back, never gives up. He fights at the Battle of um, Terek River again against Timur and is defeated. And in co as a consequence to that. Timur sacks New Sarai, completely destroys the city, and marches on and even gets as far as um, Ryazan before turning back and um, consolidating his possessions again in Iran. And here we have the clients of Timur, um, uh, Edigu and uh, Temur Kutluk, who become 
the again nominal joint rulers over the Golden Horde, ruling as clients of um, of Tamerlane. And Tamerlane, of course, will um, go, and then he will defeat the um, the Ottoman Sultan uh, Bayezid Yildirim, and then of course he will die organizing a attempted conquest of the um, of the Ming Dynasty in um, China, of course, which had replaced the Yuan Dynasty. So um, he was again one of the most um, effective military conquests of the time, and you could say he effectively destroyed in the long term the military power of the Golden Horde, even though at one point he'd briefly be responsible for restoring it with the um, original um, restoration of Toktamesh. Because when we're talking about the Golden Horde now, with Ed with um, Edigu's death in particular in 1419, um, the Golden Horde rapidly um, disintegrates. We have the Sibir in the extreme north, which is you know, obviously the origin of the term um, Siberia, you know, becomes independent. Um, Uzbek, which is actually not corresponding to Uzbekistan, modern Uzbekistan, but named after Uzbek, um, in central Kazakhstan becomes independent. Uh, the Nogai Sultanate becomes independent. The Kazan Sultanate becomes independent. Crimea becomes independent, and of course will later become a um, Ottoman ally through to the um, the conquest by um, uh, Potemkin in the 18th century. So all of these elements, which again nominally um, loyal to Sarai, are all becoming independent, um, you know, either Sultanates or Khanates in their own right. And the last vestige of authority is now reduced just to the um, uh, the the Don rivers and the um, the lower Volga rivers, just a remnant, which is now called um, the Great Horde. Um, for anyone who's um, interested in um, in more of the history of Tamerlane, here we're talking about the Toktamesh um, Timur wars in particular. And next episode, when we're talking about the rise of the Mongols, we'll get into depth about the Battle of Ankara because that's really you know the other side of the tale, just talking about the Ottoman interaction with. Um, uh, with with with, um, with Tamerlane. So moving on, you know, quickly. Um, so this doesn't you know, seriously overrun. Um, we'll get to the other invaders of Russia because it's not just the Mongols. This is a you could say a comprehensive reorganization of everything it means to be Russian at this point. You know, as you can see on this map, I've included in the east. It's the same map from um, earlier on, but it's a useful map nevertheless. So I'll continually sort of um, harken back to it to um, to point to. This is the traditional patrimony of the Rus, which as you can see is far more southerly and westerly than the modern state of Russia. And as you can see on the left hand side of the map, the Lithuanians from 1300 onwards begin this massive conquest of what you can say nearly all of modern day Ukraine and um, modern day Belarus and even parts of um, of Western Russia. You know, why was why was this possible? Well, Lithuania had only really come into a position of statehood as a result of the arrival of the Teutonic Knights and the Livonian Knights. Again, if you want more um, emphasis on the Northern Crusades, go back to episode eight the, um, of the Nations of Charlemagne series. Because from their constant raids, the raids of the Teutonic Knights, uh, the Lithuanians under their um, first Duke and later King um, Mindaugas form a, a, grand, a grand duchy and later kingdom roughly corresponding to what we'd now know as the modern state of Lithuania. And, um, but, but it doesn't stop there. I mean, Mindaugas, I believe, is one of the um, rare examples in Lithuanian history of a ruler who very early on converts to Catholicism. But all of his successors revert back to being pagan and pagan of a specifically Lithuanian kind, not a Slavic kind. And under the reigns of um, Grand Duke Vitenus and um, Gediminas in particular, um, we see this massive expansion into the devastated regions of the Rus, which nominally have been, you know, subject to um, the rule of the Golden Horde. So we're talking, you know, virtually all of Ruthenia, all of um, Belarusia. He was able to, um, Gediminas in particular, was able to acquire, you know, the kingdom of um, Halic Lodomeria. As we mentioned, that was the kingdom ruled over by, um, by Daniel of Halic, which had potentially, you know, set themselves up as the Nov kings Novgorod, of Russia. Novgorod looking pretty good, though. Yes, Novgorod. Um, Novgorod will survive until 1478. So, we'll, we'll talk about the, um, the demise of Novgorod when we get to the the rise of the of the Russian Tsars. But for now, at least, it will for the entire duration of this stream. So, going up to 1453, 
um, Novgorod will retain its independence. But and again, that's due to the fact that Novgorod didn't it wasn't sacked, it wasn't depopulated, it retained its independence and retained its wealth and its trade links. But this area, you could say this area occupied by the Lithuanians was the ground zero in terms of the original conquest, with the exception of Ryazan, which is just south of Moscow. So all of these areas, which have been once been, you know, the heart of um, civilization, have become so devastated and depopulated that the conquest was, well, relatively easy. Um, we have the first battle, you know, major battle between the rulers of um, Kiev under Stanislav at the Erpen River, which, yeah. I mean, in terms of, again, the, the literary accounts of this time, um, because of the rapid decline of the Principality of Kiev, we don't even know most of the details of the Erpen River, or even if it even happened because of the sheer decline in the, the availability of, you know, a bureau, any sort of bureaucracy or written accounts during yeah. this time. I mean, all of the sort of power and stability has moved to the north, right? Uh, yes, absolutely. The south is just totally gone, yeah. And under um, uh, the subsequent king, um, al Gaidas, we have the Lithuanians taking full position Possession of Kiev and the bulk of Ruthenia in um, 1362, and this is after the finally. I mean, the the policy of Gediminas had been to try and take over as much territory without actually directly coming to conflict with the Golden Horde. But now this is 1362, so this is after the death of Janibeg. Now that the Golden Horde is entering its period of disintegration. Now the Lithuanians are even bolder in their expansion at the expense of the Rus, and they win a decisive battle against the Golden Horde at the Battle of the Blue Rivers. And from this point on, the effective overlordship of the southern Rus is transferred from the Mongols to the Lithuanians, and this will have you know dramatic lasting legacies in terms of the, the culture of um, Russia moving forward, because here, here you can say that we have the the fundamental split between a southern Russian culture, which later become Ruthenian and finally Ukrainian, as opposed to a northern Russian culture, which will again be consciously associated with the idea of Moscow. Whereas in the south, we have a Ukrainian population under foreign rule, and this will continue up until the partitions of Poland in the 18th century. So this is um, an and, and hence and hence the name of Ukraine as the borderland, right? Yeah, well, the the origin, of course, predates that. It, it goes back to the um the twelfth century, but um within the Lithuanian context, the um the idea of a borderland definitely holds holds true. Yes, the this period also reflects a, a time where I think it's safe to say that <clears throat> the Europeans uh, have got their head around fighting uh the fighting style of the of the Mongols and the Golden Horde and and uh, and the way in which they wage war, and the Europeans um a within interfighting amongst themselves firstly but just as a, as a, as a general uh, transition and uh, development of technology um, of, of war experience uh, um, even for instance you know fighting um, in the in the in the Crusades in the Near East etc that this success that is starting to occur and you, you name that with the um, the Battle of the uh, Blue Rivers uh, apostolic that um, the veneer of invincibility of these sort of dauntless step worries is starting to diminish. Um, people realise now that they are, be in fact, beatable, um, and this is reflected in the, the the quite rapid growth of the of the expansion of Lithuania. And I mean, Lithuania eventually combined with Poland to form the one Commonwealth that comes a bit later. But this expansion is is very um, is very rapid in historical context. Absolutely, I think. I mean, I mean, it's important to note that two things. One is that Lithuania is unique in a European context because it's one of the largest um, and longest lasting pagan states. It doesn't convert until Eugalia in 1387 and that's because yeah, of yeah. a political reason to become king of Poland. And um, the it shouldn't be underestimated the power of the uh, of the Golden Horde, because um, Vitautus, the under ruler of um, Lithuania under Eugalia, or Vitautus the Great, had actually organised a crusade against the Mongols in 1399. This is just after Toktamesh was removed, nominally where the Golden Horde should be at the weakest. And at the Battle of the uh, Voskla River, the entire Lithuanian crusading party was annihilated by the Golden Horde. So even still at their you know, lowest ebb, you know, around the beginning of the 15th century, 
um, the Golden Horde are still able to pose a mighty military threat. I think this is the case throughout this entire time. It's only with the, you, you can say the beginning, sorry, the middle of the 15th century that um, the threat, you know, begins to recede. But as we're going to talk about with, you know, the Crimean interaction um, with uh, Muscovy later, uh, the Tatar wars against the, um, uh, against the, the Russians, the Tatars are constantly going to be a threat. I was just I was just going to bring in the point of um the more I learn about the character of the Lithuanians in this period and their particular history, the more the um the the later Commonwealth makes sense to me, you know what one could understand. Well, the idea of the Commonwealth is of obviously the, the you can say the genesis of the Lithuanian state is in opposition to the Teutonic Order and the Livonian Order, and by extension of that, Poland, which had originally invited and attempted to deal with the Prussian threat themselves before in turn defeated, as we discussed in episode eight, um, invited the, um, the the Teutonic Order in, who colonized Prussia, Germanized it, and made it into the principal military enemy of again the erstwhile power that invited it in. So from again pure point of survival on the Western Front, because as you can see with this map, despite the um, the principal enemy being Livonia and Prussia, um, the Lithuanians were barely able to make any gains westward. They were barely able to even get access to the sea. But again, it should show you the power of the Rus principalities versus the power or of the um, the German knights that it was so almost effortless effortless by comparison to conquer such a vast um, vast sea of territory, whereas it took the unification of Poland and um, Lithuania and their combined power in 1410, after you could say a hundred years of growing close together politically, to finally begin to check the power of the um, the Teutonic knights and finally subjugate them in 1466. Again, that's uh, probably a tale for another time. And just as a historic reference, you mentioned about access to the sea. Um, just uh, just south that little uh, on that left hand map there of, of Lithuania, where they have that tiny little strip of access to the land. Just south of that is um is uh, what would later become called the the Mevel Land, uh, which is mm -hmm. just north of the, the um is that the Tilsit River, if I'm not mistaken. The Neiman. Neiman. The Neiman. Yep. The Neiman River. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, that is now part of Monday Lithuania and was in the interwar period between World War One and Two, but more or less that little bit of access that they have there in this left-hand image is actually the the only uh, legitimate um, and and largely held access to the sea that Lithuania has for hundreds of years through the vast majority of its history, with two minor exceptions, which is today in the interwar period. That is what Lithuania has as a sea access for the majority of its existence. Just, it, it's not important, it's just a point because you have the map up. There's one uh, regarding Lithuania in particular, there's one interesting character, which is the Russian historiography's attempts to claim Algirdas for their own, which is something I, I didn't encounter before researching for this stream. Um, if you uh, I used in the last stream, this image of the, the great um, memorial, the thousand year memorial constructed in 1862. And there you have figures such as Rurik, you have figures such as Alexander Nevsky, the, you know, the heroic figures of Russian history. And on that monument, there's Algirdas. And I try to understand why, because of course he's responsible for so much in the way of the conquest of the Rus peoples. And the claim of a few Russian historians is that dis despite again the assumed claim that he was pagan is that he actually converted to orthodoxy and that he'd actually um, taken monastic vows and taken the name um, Alexius and therefore he was actually a conscious orthodox ruler over the orthodox people around um, Ruthenia and Kiev but again well that was the... quite a common tradition right that princes would 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 take on monastic orders and change their name it happened quite a lot only if you were orthodox to begin with, not if you were a devout pagan, as was the case with um, Algirdas. Oh, course, and, yeah. and when you come with um, Algirdas, for example, you have the uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, I can't remember his name, uh, referring to um, Algirdas as a, as a fire worshipper, and on the one hand, threatening to excommunicate any of the um, Ruthenian nobility who were prepared to ally with Algirdas and his um, massive conquest of, of this territory so you have too much in the way of contradictory information yet i found it quite interesting just to add there the fact that the russians did try to reclaim algirdas as some sort of um forerunner in um the, in the great sort of scope of russian history but you know regardless of whether he did secretly convert to orthodoxy is really immaterial because he is succeeded by um uh, eugalia the create you know the progenitor of the eugalion dynasty which would become one of the greatest european dynasties in the early modern period and in 1387 i believe he can 
converts to Catholicism. And why does he do this? Is because he's been offered the throne of Poland. This is the forerunner of the union between um, Lithu Lithuania and Poland, which will be solidified at the um, the Union of Lublin in 1569. And so there's therefore that material reason to convert to um, Catholicism. And the result of this is that uh, there begins the persecution of the um, Ruthenian Orthodox nobility, again, the vast amount they've inherited through the conquests, and the there are incentives given to the boyars who are prepared to convert to Catholicism. But to make Lithuanian politics even more complicated, there are two civil wars going on within Lithuania at this time. Those who believe that Eugalia has basically betrayed, <laughs> betrayed um, Lithuanian twice over. On the one hand, you have uh, Vitautus, who claimed um, you know, some sort of ancestry through um, an another sort of claim to the throne known as Kestis, who comes to an agreement, I think, in 1395, whereby he rules to... Um, there are two grand dukes, basically. Eugalia rules as the supreme duke, and um, Vitautus rules as the grand duke. So when you see this massive expansion under um, Eugalia, it's actually under Vitautus when he's expanding into um, uh, the Zafirici, which is the territory linking um, Ruthenia to the um, to the Black Sea, when he's expanding into Poltava, when he's expanding into Smolensk and pushing the borders right up until uh, Kaluga with um, with Moscow. Um, all of this is conducted under Vitautus, and of course Vitautus will be responsible for the um, disaster against the um, the Golden Horde at the Battle of the uh, the Voskala River. So, uh, but again, there's, there's another civil war as well going on because there's another claim to the throne, and there's Svitgalia, who is also fighting for the Lithuanian throne at this time. So um, just barring that aside, I, I just think it's just important to illustrate that what we're seeing is the conquest of not only the vast percentage of, you can say the majority of formerly Rus civilization by a rising Catholic power that will then transform into the um, what is known you know, contemporaneously as the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. But really, we're talking about the dual crowns of Lithuania and Poland. And it's worth mentioning too, because you look at this map here. Um, former centres, uh, former former lo lo locations and settlements, which were um, central to the Kievan rural civilization and its sort of its um, its foundation as a as as a tangible power. Kiev, Chernigov, Bryansk, Smolensk, um, arguably Vitebsk as well to some degree. Well, Polotsk um, as well, Chernigov, and, 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 Kiev, Haliac, all of these exactly, areas. Yeah. I mean, they, they have been have, you know, the, the principal powers of the South. You know, where, when Moscow didn't even exist, these areas have been you know, invested as principalities during the time of Vladimir the Great, and now they have no independence whatsoever and are part of a foreign uh, power. Exactly, they they have fallen under this this Polish Lithuanian yoke. And if you look at this map on the left hand side, uh, just because it does illustrate a bit clearly, the only places that of, of, of any note of, of the of the Rus civilization are uh, Novgorod, uh, Tver, and Moscow. And Moscow does become this 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 center point and, um, of Russian civilization. Well, from this... Although it's a minor concession to make. Indeed, it's, yes. it's it's really it's crazy probably, but... how um how how destroyed their influence is when you consider what but, comes afterwards as but, well. But it goes I mean, to show influence to is restricted so much. Exactly, and it does in some ways. You know, like it's kind of reminiscent of that. If you, if you look at that map of you know the fall of the West Roman Empire, and you know the West is just dilapidated and and owned uh, by by foreign powers, and then you have this burgeoning sort of surviving eastern half that's centered around Constantinople. Kind of Moscow, in some ways, echoes that sentiment in a really strange way, where the, this Rus power has gravitated eastwards, is centered around Moscow, and then Moscow does become the preeminent city of this civilization. Precisely, yes, and um, all the more remarkable considering we're talking about the, the fall of all of these great cities. Now, if anything, this should demonstrate, we talked about the original invasion at the beginning of the stream, how utterly devastating the original invasion was, because all of these areas which were dispossessed and depopulated and their entire economies destroyed, it takes hundreds of years for any of this region to retain you know, any sort of viable economy. And even then, it is paled in comparison with the north with moscow in particular so what we're talking about is a one of the most his, consequential historical events in history by which the entire history of russia has changed irrevocably and that yes, really i mean it, it's the yes i mean this is why we have a a russian empire ruled from moscow which stretches across you know the entirety of um of central asia and not and not one that's run from the south yes and, um 
an interesting an interesting fate for what was once a, a, a an insignificant hill fort. <laughs> yes, like literally only two hundred years before as well. <laughs> yes, well, building upon this, um, well, not even two hundred, only a hundred from the um, the period we're talking about. So, building on this um, insignificant uh, hill fort story, um, we've had the death of Janibeg just moving back a, a little bit in the um, the time scope to talk about what happened after the um, the death of Janibeg when it came to Russia. Well, um, we had the the relatively uneventful reigns of Simeon, who died of the Black Death, and then Ivan the Second, and in thirteen fifty four nine we have the arrival of uh, Dmitry Donskoy and wary of the power of Moscow the golden Khan on the pretext that Dmitry was a minor the rank of grand prince was actually bestowed to a rival prince again almost directly under the control of the golden horde in uh, Nizhny Novgorod and just to prevent this being confusing to some people there are two prominent novgorods yes this is Russia. like lesser novgorod <laughs> there are there's nizhny novgorod which is east of moscow and there's veliki novgorod which is the principal novgorod which we've been talking about in the same case there is a rostov in the proximity of moscow and there is of course rostov on the don at the same time just to um to, just to make that clear for people but um in continuing Continuing with, um, you know, uh, we mentioned the traditional rivalry with the, the city of Tver. Um, the Prince of Tver actually invites Algirdas, the Grand Duke of Lithuania, to sack Moscow. And this is called the, um, at, at the beginning of the reign of Dmitry Donskoy, and this is called the uh, Livochina, which is a series of escalating raids by Lithuania as they're, you know, beginning their you know, constant march eastwards to you know eliminate the power of moscow and allow for tver to exercise some form of independence because you can see on this map um right in the center you can see this basically this encroachment this little space which is becoming enveloped by uh russian inf by moscovite influence all around and right in the center is the city of tver uh, so basically by the time we get to the reign of ivan the third the city <laughs> quite a is, desperate um, gamble the city is basically powerless and um obviously allying with the lithuanians to destroy moscow is a desperate gamble and um it doesn't pay off one of the reasons why is that um the moscow kremlin has just been you know created in 1367 so the city is able to um hold out from the um the lithuanian threat um, but also, well, why else is Dmitry Donskoy um, interesting is because due to the disintegration of the Horde, which we've been discussing, Dmitry, unlike his father, um, Moneybags, uh, Ivan I, uh, Kalita, was the first Muscovite prince to openly challenge Mongol authority. So leading the Russian principalities under the aegis of not only just liberating Russians from Mongol rule, but you know, inspired by his tutor, um, Metropolitan Alexis, this is a orthodox crusade, as it were, against the Mongols at the same time. Um, he is able to defeat the horde general and later you know, partial ruler, um, Mamai, at the battles of uh, Voja in 1378. And then he's able to inflict a much greater defeat on the, um, the Mongols at the Battle of uh, uh, Kurkovo in 1380. However, as with everything, you know, related to the Russians, this isn't so straightforward, because then we have the in unfortunate arrival of Tokhtmesh for the Russians. So Dmitry's resistance was relatively short-lived. Tokhtmesh comes in, he's restored power to the Horde, and he sacks Moscow in 1382 and compels Dmitry Donskoy back into a position of um, submission. So the actual sig long-term significance of Kurkovo is only really, as with Alexander Nevsky, a lot of it is due to the um, sy symbolic significance of this, of this being a, um, a direct attempt to try and undermine the power of the Horde. But again, as we need to reiterate, despite the fact that the Horde always seems to be um, declining and, you know, um, in this constant state of civil wars, whenever a Rus state or even, you know, Lithuania attempts to press the, you know, the power of um, the, the Golden Horde too hard, you know, believes it's, you know, no longer a military threat, there's always some sort of pushback and the Golden Horde makes some sort of um, temporary recovery, as was the case with um, with Toktomesh. But, you know, Dmitry Donskoy, despite his, um, you can say, premature attempt to liberate Moscovy, from the um, the Mongol yoke, he leaves Muscovy, as you can see on this map, the the ever increasing size of um, the Muscovite principality. And again, these are the richest areas of Russia, as opposed to the far more sparsely populated regions to the north under um, the principal under the Republic of Novgorod. Um, Dmitry Donskoy leaves Muscovy far richer than he encountered it, and when he finally passes on his throne to his son Vasily. 
uh, Vasily just simply inherits the rank of Grand Prince. So the idea of Grand Prince of Vladimir is now redundant. They are now simply the Grand Prince of Moscow. The idea that any other Russian prince would have this preeminence is now a complete nonsense. And thereafter, the idea of the Grand Prince of Moscow and later Tsar uh, is associated of years, with, yeah. um, with the idea of the, the ruler of Moscow. But even then, um, Vasily, again, attempts to basically ignore the Mongols. It's his policy, believing if he doesn't pay them tribute, they're so weakened that they won't be able to command. But even under um, uh, Timur's puppet, Edgu, they're still able to nearly take the city of Moscow. So again, from 1408, they're forced into this tributary position again, but just to emphasize how this really is a process of um, the Mongols, again, constantly fighting back, constantly emphasizing their nominal authority over this region. But every time the fight back is slightly weaker and weaker and weaker. And um, we'll talk about the final sort of decisive event, which ends the um, the Mongol yoke when we talk about Ivan the third, but that hasn't happened yet. It's worth reflecting on the fact that, you know, had this happened to, um, you know, Genghis or, or Hoogaloo or Kublai or Ogade, or I suppose even Timur to some extent, you know, had he been more at, closer at hand to have dealt with a situation like this, because I mean, it is, arguably his vassals who were dealing with the situation in Moscow, that um, there would have been a capture of Moscow and there would have been piles of skulls. Um, mm -hmm. But but this real pitiless hard edgeness of the horde has also diminished. They, they're quite content just to to scare the, the, the Muscovites and and um, defeat them or, you know, or at least bloody them in battle and just take tribute and walk home, whereas a, a prior generation of Mongol warriors would have absolutely just torched the city without a second thought yeah i mean it also him. explains um you know the, the the great stand which comes right because the mongol forces there's a real reticence because because there's a lot of debate when that stand comes about the motives why why they held back and and the main reason that i can i can think of is because the situation back at home um in the horde is so unstable and they know that if they they risk a battle and it goes poorly then um um there's very little chance of of holding on to power back home yeah, the loss of the army would too much of a threat to the dilution yeah. of their power. Yeah. Well, there's, there's another reason I think I can I can answer that. Um, in the West, they had so decisively weakened their vassals in the Rus that they had been easily conquered by another power. So, to my mind, there is this idea that had they done what you, you suggested, Marcus, had gone in and destroyed the principal power centers in Moscow. It wouldn't be the Mongols who would be benefiting from it. It would be the Lithuanians who would be benefiting from it. They would simply sweep in and annex even more territory at the expense of the Golden Horde, therefore creating, again, potentially an even worse threat to them in the long term. So there's this idea that now we're entering entering into the period of balance, the politics of the balance of power, that you need to hold on to Moscovy as a potential ally against the Lithuanians if they were to attack both of them at the same yeah, time. Yeah, the threat of sort of punishing your vassals so much that they're simply unable to hold their territory against what is essentially another geopolitical mm. adversary on the other side. So you want to re re retain situation. a buffer state, essentially. Mm. Yes, yeah. precisely. Mm. And, and again, just... The, 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 we are talking the Lithuanians were you know probably one of the, the great powers of the 15th century not probably they were the great powers of the 15th century and again it obviously didn't serve the interest of the golden horde to have all of their vassals who were paying them tribute gobbled up by this new rising power so again weakening the Muscovite state would have simply in my mind at least accelerated that process I mean even with the strength of Moscow you know had it you know with its relatively light treatment to the hand of the Mongols and something we've been entirely you know willing to emphasize again and again and again is that Moscow was a piece was basically a center of tranquility uh, compared to all of the um, horrific destruction around them during this time and even with this um, relative stability um, look how far the Lithuanian borders are pushing they're only you know literally you know a couple of hundred miles within the city of Moscow itself. So any further weakening could have potentially been disastrous again for the position of the Mongol horde as this new power was entering in. But before again, we enter too much onto the course of um, counterfactual history. Um, Vasily... Yes, it's always a risky game, isn't it? Yes. Uh, Vasily maintains a relatively peaceful reign around this time. He maintains, again, from this point, no dramatic actions like his father against the, um, the horde. And um, in fact, his loyalty to the Horde is so much appreciated that he's actually given over territory for them, and particularly it's um, the city of Nizhny Novgorod. And, um, and also, as we can see in the West, he largely acquiesces 
to the rapid expansion of Lithuania. His father, Don Skoy, had defeated the Lithuanians in their raids, but it's during the reign of um, Vasily that um, uh, Vitautas the Great expands and takes over, again, one of the great Russian principalities, that of the um, Principality of Smolensk, and pushes the border to, um, to Kaluga. And um, so uh, when we talk about Muscovite expansion, again, talk about the complete geographic relocation of Russia at this point. Russia, as you can see on this map, is expanding eastwards. It's not expanding west into the former Rus territories. It's not expanding to the original, basically the highway of the Rus between Novgorod and Kiev, that being the um, the Dnieper River. It's expanding eastwards to the Ural Yes, Mountain. the direction of expansion has changed, and, and that direction will certainly continue. <laughs> and it will continue, it's... and it'll they'll continue until they reach all the way to the um, the Pacific Ocean. So, yeah. It's, yeah. it's 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 an interesting uh you, you have all have heard me often say that history infrequently is the same but very often rhymes or infrequently repeats itself and it's funny how the um you might say the frontier of the this principality of Moscovy um uh facing westwards is uh Rzhev, Mozhaisk, uh, Kaluga and Tula if anyone with any um history of the eastern front of World War II all of those places are very significant <laughs> if I may say so and we'll uh, and we'll get round to that in two years time we will years we will when we get it will. But, <laughs> so, so, so every, so every, every, everyone in the chat just bookmark it and we'll, we'll get there in two years episode 60 of orthodoxy autocracy and nationality anyway um yes uh, in terms of the uh, cultural uh, cultural level of this um obviously we have the ex massive expansion of russian monasteries during this time we already mentioned the fact that the original founder of um of of new moscow daniel um Nevsky, had um established his own monasteries and had become a monk well under the reforms of um saint sergius we have the these incredible monasteries set up in incredibly remote um northern locations that then periodically later become the um preferred locations of exiles of um various royal princes and um yes disgraced, that happens um, quite a lot arrives. i mean the, the 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 novgorods um were doing that for, for a long time you know they would um um the bishops and and the monasteries would sort of take in whoever's been thrown out um, um of the turmoil of the republican politics yes then there's one last because we're already two hours and 20 minutes and there's one last um, element which I want to touch on, which is the moment that could have potentially und uh, undone all of them, the achievements of Muscovy, which is the Muscovite civil war throughout the uh, reign of Vasily II. Uh, we've been at pains to again emphasize how primogeniture was so important for the rise of Moscow. Nevertheless, the rota system still had, and the idea of collateral succession, i.e. the eldest male inheriting, not the eldest son, um, had a incredibly strong impression on the Russian mind. And when Vasily inherits from his father, the Se Vasily II inherits at the age of 10, um, his uncles immediately begin to um, press their claims on the throne, if not, again, to acquire the throne, then to divvy up mm. the possessions of the... I mean, the fact that he's so young doesn't help as well, right? Well, again, I mean, that's it's, an it's opportunity. An insult. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's an opportunity, again, to, to expand. And this goes very well for, for them at first. Um, Vasily II is deposed by his uncle Yuri in 1433. He's not killed, however, so he returns rather easily and deposes his uncle. Then this claim doesn't simply die with Yuri, Yuri's son Vasily again, just to make it even more complicated, um, tries to seize the throne again, and he is captured and blinded. You can say a carry on from the, the Byzantine history we're talking about in the Golden Age episode. And with the securing of his throne, you know, often when a ruler is consolidated the home front, he then tries to direct his nobles' energy towards a hostile threat. In this case, it was the um, successor state of the um, Golden Horde, the Khanate of Kazan, which turns out to be a complete and utter disaster for, for the Russians, because Vasily II is captured. And when he's finally ransomed back, the regent of Russia, uh, Dmitry Shemyaka, um, has Vasily II blinded and exiled, a again, equivalent of all those um, Russian, uh, sorry, uh, Byzantine emperors that we've been talking about before. It's kind of sad, sad. it sounds very East Roman. <laughs> Hmm. But, but nevertheless, <laughs> even, even the blinded Vasily II, against all odds, is able to um, retake the throne, and this time relying on his um, son Ivan as co-ruler. So by 1453, he had eliminated all the contenders of his authority. He had re-established um, primogeniture, and 
as a result of that, he had further, um, further centralized the Muscovite state. And this is the basis from which his son, Ivan III Veliki, will later go on and form what we now recognize as Russia. But I think, obviously, that's the topic for the next stream. We've talked about the, the Mongol yoke and the rise of Muscovy, and um, this is where we're going to leave the discussion for now. So um, we'll get, mm -hmm. unless anyone has any sort of final remarks to make, um, we can get on to the Super Chats. No, I, Marcus... I'll just... I'll just go to, I mean, in the end, I sort of only said it 10 or so minutes ago, but I, I think we re definitely see this definitive transition at, uh, from from those early settlements, you know, primarily Kiev and some of those other places that we had mentioned, you know, the Chernigov, Razan, uh, Smolensk, et cetera, and this definitive transition of gravity to Moscow. And like I said, kind of like a repeat of, of sort of Roman Byzantium um, within the one empire and that movement of, of the center, uh, the gravity of power. We see the same here, the sort of Moscow from this point uh, becomes this critical mass, this sort of center point, this core of, of Russian civilization that is, is existent to this day. It, it, yeah. it, it has not changed. It has remained so. Um, and, it's and, also, and, this, um, and this time period is that when that happens. Yeah, I mean, and we also see, I mean, the the strong and very clear establishment of of a monarchy, right? Um, um, uh, and, mm, yeah. uh, and a hereditary monarchy. And this this is something that is essential for the stability and expansion of the state, as opposed to, I mean, I mean, you know, no Novgorod, if you read about it, um, it, never, it never ceases to amuse. And I would encourage everyone to go and read the Novgorod Chronicle, because there are some, there are some remarkable things in here. I mean, I mean, I mean, apparently at one point, um, in Novgorod, because the people would elect their 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 bishops, you know, and their and their abbots and what have you. Apparently, once they elected a <laughs> further further abbot, they elected a, I think a seventeen year old or eighteen year old um, daughter of some merchant. <laughs> and it, you know, it didn't go down very well. And a couple of months after, she was turfed out. But um, you know, I mean, one could understand after after such ferment for such a long time how uh, um, um, an autocracy um, could be appealing and effective. The, the, the other, just on that point, it was, what's worth mentioning too, just as a sort of a mental exercise, is that um, because obviously Apostoli, we've talked about this to some degree on uh, the Germany streams we've done and, uh, you know, comparing, say, Germany with Russia and how Russia at that point in time, you know, the, the Tsardom is considered this really sort of author authoritarian, sort of top-down hierarchical, the aristocracy and the peasant kind of society, um, you know, and, and say like with World War One, you sort of have these so-called democratic powers, you know, uh, aligning um, with what would be the most autocratic power in Europe. Um, but Russia's history from this time and early is actually yes, uh, we have, we have, it's... Definitely. I mean, we have this stereotype that Russia has always been um, um, an autocracy. And I you know I'm, I've just, I've just talked about, I mean, it's very clear that there are benefits to that system, but I mean, mm. when one, when one looks at, you know, the Republic of Novgorod, particularly, um, it's most comparable, I mean, in its politics to, like I said, maybe ancient Athens, but also like Florence, you know, in these mercantile mm. cities in the north of Italy. Mm. Um, yeah. um, and it's just, it's just, or, or even, it, or even bit, Rome prior to the empire in some ways. Perhaps, so, as yeah, a republic, yeah. You know? um, especially with these, um, um, you know, the sort of the mm. city, the city deputy who would sometimes come in and, and they would toss out the prince. There were all sorts of um, um, very interesting things going on. They're very surprising to, to read. And about. that's reminiscent. That's almost reminiscent of the role of the Tribune in some ways. Um, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. not the same thing, but it, it, it's reminiscent. Um, and, and just quickly, uh, what I was going to say is also that, um, yeah, it, it does sort of, to some degree, smash that assumption of, of, of the Russian state. But then, of course, you know, it's suffered a massive period of turmoil and suffering. And so what does it do? It gravitates towards autocracy. It gains. Um, and what's interesting, I suppose we'll get to this on the next stream, but once we have this sort of second infusion of, of, of Byzantine influence into, into Russia, you know, just as, you know, the East Rome is extinguished by the Turks and we have the marriage of uh, Sophia Palaiologos um, in, into the, into the, into the, uh, the, the Russian throne. Um, they go from being grand dukes to being um, to becoming czars. Um, yeah, in a, in, in a matter of a couple hundred as, um, years, they assume yeah, this it, title. It, you know, yeah, no, it's pretty much just as um, um, the emperors in Constantinople are having mm. their their final days. Yeah, the, the sort of um, the imperial dignity is transferred, and and also mm. the, the the torch of Orthodox culture more generally yeah. is passed to the Russians. Quite literally, Moscow is the third Rome. Yeah. Wonderful. So moving on to the super chats, uh, Lady of Shalott for five pounds says, 
Was there a religious element to the Mongols conquering at all? Did they force the conquered to convert, if appropriate, or was this not a concern? I think we tried to elucidate that Genghis Khan was, of course, concerned with world conquest, but he was at pains to indicate that the individual cultures and religions should be left alone, essentially, albeit they acknowledged the supremacy of the Great Khan, and in the case of the cult of the Great Khan, as, as Columbo yeah. elucidated, basically a so, somewhat superficial equivalent to the... Um, uh, the Roman the, Imperial to, Cult, to the Roman yeah. Imperial Cult, without the essential impetus of the Pontifex Maximus to organize all religions. Because yes, course, I mean the, Tengri. Um, Tengri religion is is like like many things in the steppe world, a uh, sort of a heady mishmash of a lot of different things, and it's and it's not um, uh, an organized religion in any sense, like 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 um, Catholicism. Say, absolutely, and, oh, um, uh, 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 which contrasts with with Timur, of course, who had a very different bent in that regard. Yes, Timur was a devout Muslim, but it didn't really matter the fact he was also destroying um, Muslims. I mean, all that really mattered was that he destroyed all their cities. He took all their, mm. you know, craftsmen and artisans and scholars, yeah. and he would basically build this, um, you, you could say, this wonderment of Muslim architecture in the, uh, uh, what is it, the the, the, the Reistan Square in um in Samarkand, which has this mm. incredible sort of monumental architecture with these um beautiful. It's a very impressive um thing for where it is. You know, it's a it's a it's a wonder. I've never been there personally, but yeah, you see where Samarkand is on a map, and then you see those buildings, and it's wondrous. In fairness to Samarkand, Samarkand has an ancient history. I mean, the Greeks mm. refer to it as Makanda, and it's this yes. idea that it um it occupies this central position of the trade confluence between the the Persian world, obviously during mm. Alexander, that was the extension of the Greek world, and the Chinese dynasty at the same time. So yeah. as a consequence of that, at the center of Transoxania, I mean, Samarkand is just one of many wealthy cities within that region, yeah. the others, of course, being um, of course. Kiva and um, Bukhara and Balkh. Merv as well, um, mm. and historically, we had Alexander Escate, etc. Yeah, yes. of course. And even, even so, and it's going on a tangent, but even to the north of that region, um, you have a relatively fertile region in the Fagana Valley, which is just to the north of um, Samarkand yeah. at the same time. The, the, so, the um, War of the Heavenly Horses with the Chinese? <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, that, that's, yes. that's an element. Yeah, indeed. Was it? Kings and Generals covered that at some point. But anyway, mm. um, Marcus yes. 58 for eight Australian dollars. Uh, you guys didn't mention the infamous retaliatory campaigns, divine retribution of Ifpati Kolovrat against the great Mongol conquest. Well, mm. we're talking about, um, was it the, the, oh my goodness, this is the, um, the, the tale of the destruction of Ryazan, if I remember, yeah. but, um, uh, and of course he, well, and again, it's hard as with many of these figures due to the, the nature of this history to actually yeah. <laughs> talk about the, the legendary figures, even with figures which are very historical, such yeah. as Alexander Nevsky. The sources are extremely spotty. It, it, it borders on being apocryphal in a way. Um, mm, but yeah. the tales, it, the tales fascinating nonetheless, what was it like him and 2000 survivors and they just relentlessly harass the, the Mongols as they crisscross through Rus territory and they attack camps and, Sleep to throw the Mongol warriors in their sleep, and they sort of do. They do to the Mongols, or the Mongols do to unto others, which is strange, which is interesting. But yeah, we the ascertaining the authenticity of these claims will always be difficult. Yeah, but it's a great tale nonetheless. Sorry to be so boring. Um, <laughs> Barbarian from Hero Quest for five pounds. Great stream. Did you come across any records of the amount of tribute being paid to the Golden Hall through this period? Well, one of the. I mean, I'm unless I'm sort of being very specific and geeky about this sort of thing, I tend to avoid using currency definitions simply because due to, you know, understanding the inflation of that time, it really doesn't seem to mean something. Sometimes I refer to, you know, amounts of silver and gold, something tangible. But um, in terms of tribute, the main sort of thing which I'm keen to emphasize is that um, Russia had been, you know, so severely sort of um, destroyed by this region that f from my understanding one of the uh, largest amounts of tribute was actually taken in the form of slaves and we yes. are seeing the um, the emergence of probably the largest European slave network operated through the Golden Hall during this time. And I think one of the reasons for this is that um, or, or one of the prime reasons is that slaves were in many places eminently available. I mean, I mean, you had the call-up system, if I'm pronouncing that right, you know, uh, which would then, of course, later turn into the surf system. And so there was there was a, a large slave population, and of course, slaves are um, by their very nature a more portable asset as well. 
Also, it's worth considering too that at this point in time, we still have the presence of the Italian maritime states, the Genoese and the uh, Venetians, with holdings in uh, in the Kuban and the Azov, um, yeah. having cannibalized much of the Greek former, formerly Greek Peritea in the South Crimea, and these Italian city states also trading with the North African. Um, Bailix in the right word, I'm trying to think of what Yes, and they're all too happy to deal in these products, unfortunately. Yeah, and so these Mediterranean markets, be they Turkish or Arab or Berber, will take these um, slaves. And so the the successor state, the Mongol successor states and the Italian maritime republics, and then from there, the Muslim world of the South Mediterranean are more than happy to do business with each other. So these markets remain lucrative for some time, up until the Ottomans themselves conquer the the um and they sort of turn the Black Sea into sort of their own Mare Nostrum in the uh, 1500s. Hmm. Well, thank you for that, Marcus. Tweety Bird for five Canadian dollars says, do Muslims today bear the Mongols of old any ill will? Do they have any cultural memory of the Golden Horde? Regarding cultural memory of the Golden Horde... Well, yes, Baghdad there... was a centre of the Arab world. I mean, I mean, I absolutely. imagine that I mean, that would hit hard. <laughs> absolutely, and I, I do hear sometimes Muslims, you know, when I do bring this up, they do talk about this. It's, to me, the equivalent for the sack of Baghdad is... The, the Library of, the of Orthodox, Alexandria. The, or, no, the Orthodox sack, at the, to the Orthodox, the sack of Constantinople in 1204. Mm. It is this um, horrific event. I mean, to, in terms of like Muslim historiography, 1258 is often seen as the end of the Islamic golden age of culture, essentially. Exactly. So, yeah. I mean, in, in Baghdad, you had the House of Wisdom, you know, the, the libraries, yes. the, the, the astronomers, everything. Because it's, it's, it's worth um, taking into account, too, that when the Arabs themselves conquered, because pr Baghdad, prior to being called Baghdad, was essentially the old Sassanid Persian city of Tessaphon. And the mm. Arabs themselves didn't really destroy Tessaphon. They actually barely laid a finger on it and had kept most of the city intact. I mean, obviously it became Islamicized and you had the Miranets and the mosques, etc. But the, the city itself had retained much of its grandeur from even the Sassanid period. Um, and so... Even a somewhat and, similar architectural style. Yeah, well, exactly. Like, like in the end, the, the, one of the biggest claims historically about the Arabs is the fact that the Persians actually sort of uh, Persianized the Arabs to some degree, sort of gave them a cultural veneer that they didn't possess prior to the conquest of Persia. And so Baghdad is the center point of that of that culture, probably second to only, um, I mean, Tehran wasn't a major city at this point, but to some of those actually, uh, some of those cities actually located within Persia proper. And the the, the two, because you've got to think, there's the, the sack by Hugulu and then the, there's the sack by Timur a little bit later. And both of those attacks are catastrophic. They murder the population. They burn it to a crisp. But they, they sort of almost give Ka uh, Baghdad almost the Carthage treatment just without the literal tearing down of buildings. But it's comprehensive. And it, no doubt, I mean, the fact that, like Apostolic said, they will reference it um, today. For them, is it a big deal? And just if I may buttress that point slightly, because I've actually been to the Anatolian Civilization Museum in, in Ankara, and it's a wonderful uh, thing to see, actually. But, but, <laughs> um, and, and this is true, obviously, with the Turks, because they are distinct people from the Arabs, obviously. But there's a period that coincides with the, 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 the Timur's attacks in Anatolia. No artifacts no references, no currency, just a black spot in the museum. It's an interesting <laughs> telling, yeah. like it, 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 without a word, without saying anything, that in itself is a telling demonstration of how they feel about it now. Yes, yes, I about to bring silence up, um, can speak. <laughs> I, was, I mean, from my understanding, when I when I talk to Muslims about this, the idea is that Tamerlane is some sort of traitor to the faith. The idea mm, that quite. as the, again, under the auspices of Islam, he, again almost exclusively with the exception of um georgia and uh, in addition i mean you have to understand that tamerlane was also responsible for annihilating christians within um iran i mean we have ancient christian sects originating from the the time of the apostolic age and in particular i'm talking about the um the syrian church and these elements were like well and truly prior to muhammad you're yes, talking well and truly, very old. Talking 500 years prior to Muhammad. Yeah. And these churches were annihilated in addition to the Christian state of Georgia, again, being sacked after the original um, experience of the Mongols. So for Christians and Muslims, he is a figure to be, you know, utterly vilified. And of, course, he, and of course, he's a figure to be um, all, all the scourge of God, really. I mean, even um, if you go to Delhi, what does he do when he sacks, when he sacks Delhi? He, I mean, even the fact that Delhi was nominally a... Um, uh, a, 
Muslim state, the Delhi Sultanate. He also led a, a mission attacking the idols, the Hindu idols in any of the Indian cities he encountered. So to all religions, you can say that um, Tamerlane was a scourge. <laughs> And, it's like giving is, Richard Dawkins an army or something. <laughs> it, it's it, it, quite. It's um. It's also kind of true to some degree with Hugulu, and probably in a way more explicitly so because Hugulu was very very happy to ally with the the remnant Crusader states and with Byzantium um and its breakaway regimes and and the Georgians as well. Um and, and so when Hugulu actually sacked Baghdad the first the first time, he essentially did it in collusions with the Christians. So Hugulu especially is vilified uh, in his own way. Yes, regarding the second part of the street, which is the cultural memory of the Golden Horde, well, you have to remember to the various Cossack peoples, the various Tatar groups of which there are still millions in Russia, um, especially due to the fact that many of these groups were dispossessed of their former lands and moved around during the, um, the, the time of Stalin. Um, the Golden Horde, to them at least, is a period of political independence against Russia. And in that sense, I do believe the Golden Horde even today has, if not an Islamic memory in particular, definitely a cultural link with all of the um, peoples of the steppe, of which, again, yeah, there are still yeah. many. I, 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 you might say consciousness of the Tatar peoples. Yes. Yeah. And, and possibly some of the North Caucasians as well. The, certainly the, the, you know, like say what we call the Chechens and what have you. The yeah, no, I, I mean, I think, um, I think people are too quick to characterize when they think of the Mongols. They think of them exclusively as this, perhaps this East Asian phenomenon but i mean very, I mean, some, in a very some, monolithic sense yes yes but i mean some of the sources i mean i i'm pretty sure even you know, the you know the famous secret history of um of the mongols um which of course i mean it was written um by the descendants of all guys so you know maybe a hundred years 150 years yeah 100 years after genghis and it describes genghis as having you know red hair and green eyes so i mean the, perhaps these ideas that we have um, um certain notions are totally wrong and i think that's one of the main reasons why people um um can't can't, can't appreciate this affinity that that um, step peoples more broadly might have I with think, the, the golden horde and what i think you. that brings up an interesting point actually which we failed to address which is to what extent did the mongols assimilate with the local cultures other than in the purely religious sense and when it comes to i, I mean obviously the Mongols had no written language before Genghis, and when they picked up a script, it was basically imported by the imported from the Uyghurs. But nevertheless, when we have talk about you know official correspondence, Mongol was still the language of official administration, albeit with you know elements of Arabic, elements of Persian, because of the again diffusion, the need to admit, to administer to this empire and many of the you know muslim powers in the region again spoke persian or they spoke um arab or invariably they spoke turkish so invariably all of these languages you know impressed upon the influence but, but i mean in terms of the mongol language in particular it did survive but you know what did every ordinary people speak well they spoke you know either the the languages of the kumans and the kipchaks which had been there previously because the mongols again they weren't a colonizing force they arised as they were basically a, a arrived in the region as a elite military caste ruling over the peoples and often as with the case with the yuan as with the case of the ilkhanate they became assimilated with the local cultures they conquered and i think there is some form of cultural synthesis with the golden horde in which the very distinctive mongols compared to the local populations that had been there at the time which again were principally turkic it needs to be pointed out or you know um the other affiliated tartar groups there was a, a general process of assimilation over which the idea of a distinct mongol identity effectively became you know yes absorbed into the local population i mean it's not as if they were particularly learned i mean you know before the secret history that i mentioned there's literally nothing <laughs> you know there's nothing there's no literature there's no histories there's nothing um so yeah so, so yeah they were they were absolutely forced into this especially when it comes to administration i mean how are you going to administer um, um an empire if you have no no sort of scripts no literary culture at all and of course they have to make accommodations for the scribes whom they are forcing to um to work for them i have so to I say think... whenever you say secret history colombo always have some mental image of procopius furiously scribbling with his <laughs> with his quill like in, in, in a room somewhere in constantinople like pouring scorn on justin in theodora we do I'm love sorry. a good secret history we do i think that's um quite a good place to leave off the discussion so um Indeed. uh do any of you guys have anything you want to um to shill before we um close out for this evening I don't. I just have to go and feed my cat. 
Um, I I will only just shill uh, the fact that I was. I mean, I said it yesterday, but we might have other viewers. So I was uh, on with the Prudentialist. Uh, Indeed. Uh, what was twenty four hours ago? Um, because obviously you had you had to, or just under because you guys kindly rearranged the stream for me last night. Yes, yeah, so you had your back to back performance. Um, Yes, and and because I've we've done like I think four streams in a week. Um, but just in reference to the chat, I, uh, I again AM was not late. I was late, um, which I think is the second time this week. And I I've just had to squeeze in these streams and being in Australia, it's it, it's rather truncated time wise. So thank you for the chat for being um uh, patient. And it's certainly not AM's fault. And of course, uh, a big gratitude to my co-host who not only uh um accommodated me yesterday time wise but a patient when i i do sometimes pop in a, a minute or two late so i am sorry to everyone it is my fault and um yes hopefully as as now i'm doing not 20 streams in a week <laughs> it might be on my <laughs> own function, so well you've got to get the most in before the you know the clamp closes completely over there of down course, under. Of course. No, so, so thank you guys i'm most pre i'm most uh most grateful and of course of the chat thank you as well for your patience well, I'll, I'll contemplate forgiving you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> I am most grateful, good sir. Thank you. I appreciate your your good grace. Indeed. So, just th a big thank you to my patrons again. Just just listed here. So, thank you so much. If you have any interest in um, donating to the channel, the link is in the description. I I, I believe. Um, regarding what's next, um, the next stream will be next Monday, and we will be talking about the rise of the Ottomans and the destruction of the Byzantine Empire. So, do tune in for that promise to be juicy don't don't say it so <laughs> <laughs> you'll get to hear marcus weep live on air everybody <laughs> so thank you very okay. much uh, thank you very much everyone for listening thank you to my wonderful co-hosts for being on such great form and good night good night good night everyone take care